You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. All right, and welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. Uh, I'm your host, Shane, coming to you as uh, as usual from uh, the homestead here uh, in southern Illinois. Uh, here with uh, a brief introduction to uh, today's episode, uh, today's episode release. Uh, basically, uh, I wanted to, uh, to to get back to the temporary autonomous home series that we've been working on, uh, that we uh, you know released an episode or two of the the introductory episode, uh, as well as uh, my interview with uh, John Vibes. Uh, on the rave as it has but uh yeah uh, obviously some things have taken precedence and uh we haven't uh, gotten back to that uh, but uh, that changed uh, as of uh, as of this morning um i realized that during our building the second realm series on libertarian attack radio uh, we actually did a uh, two ep- uh, we did two episodes on temporary autonomous zones and permanent autonomous zones uh so uh you know i i, I like to uh to, to not reinvent the wheel uh, if I don't have to, so I went back and uh, listened to it to see, uh, you know, because it had been uh, um, these episodes are from February twenty fifth and March fourth, fourth, two thousand eighteen. Uh, yeah, I didn't remember exactly, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, what was said in those episodes. So I re- re-listened to them today, uh, edited them down a little bit, and uh, I'm very, very happy with the episodes. Um, yeah, and uh, that's that's a good thing because I, I look back to some of the episodes I've done from like twenty fifteen, and uh, yeah, obviously there's uh, some things I disagree with clearly, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, the things change, things can change pretty quickly, but I'm very, very, very happy with this episode. Um, and, uh, I really just cut out, uh, Kyle used to go into, uh, and our, our longtime listeners will remember this. Um, and, uh, that was after editing, uh, after post-production, uh, mind you. Um, but there used to be times when, when Kyle would, t- would talk about, uh, um, his, uh, employment in the Cerebral Society and it worked, it worked for most episodes, but there's some where it would drag on. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I edited out, uh, I think there's 30 minutes of that in the beginning and, um, there was, uh, maybe a, a few minutes, uh, throughout. Um, uh, but, but really, uh, this episode is, uh, these, I, I basically just combined the two episodes, um, that made up the Second Realm series, uh, again, that we did over on Liberty Attack Radio, uh, com forward slash Second Realm. So, yeah, I mean, uh, uh in these two episodes, uh, I, I guess the, the way that I broke it up was, uh, the first, the first episode, w- uh, we spent talking about, um, we introduced the concepts, uh, temporary autonomous zones and per- permanent autonomous zones, uh, went over examples of lifestyles uh, and differences. Um, and then, yeah, in that first episode, we primarily focused on, on Taz's. But uh, we also discussed, and this is a, I, I forgot about this, but um, we talked about Rajava uh, as a Paz. But uh, um, yeah, in, in terms of uh, this, this first episode on Taz's, uh, we talked about the Taz in the Second Realm, uh, the Taz as a uh, festival or carnival. Uh, we, we spent a decent amount of time talking about, actually, uh, which I... Again, pleasantly surprised to hear the hear the discussion, uh, <laughs> re-listening to your own podcast. But uh, yeah, the left and uh, the reasons for alternative lifestyles. Uh, so like uh, van nomads, uh, tiny house movement, uh, frugality, uh, minimalism, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, the trend towards peer-to-peer uh, decentralization. Uh, the net and the web, which is a title from, uh, I guess, a, a, a section of uh, Hakeem Bey's uh, book. Uh, the early internet uh, and its role in Taz is basically what he what uh, what's discussed there. And Kyle and I um, elaborate further uh, and talk about uh, you know using the internet to coordinate Tazes and Pazes. Uh, the next thing we, we talk about is uh, gone to grow a or going native. Um, basically, the idea here, and, and, and again, we go very in depth on this. Uh, Kyle especially does, uh, and I, it's a very very fascinating discussion. But uh, basically, abandoning the servile society for the second realm, um, abandoning uh, abandoning the corrupt Western society, um, and going somewhere where you can be free and where your autonomy is respected. Um, and uh, and, and uh, Hakim Bey uh, explains this using um, an example from uh, colonial America. It's a very interesting example. Uh, next, the Taz is a peaceful solution. Uh, so instead of uh, 
um, you know, in terms of uh, permanent autonomous zones, you've got to kind of defend the land because um, you're you're invested. If you put a lot of money and time into a permanent permaculture farm, or you've got a lot of a lot of time, money, and effort, and just invested in general in the homestead, uh, it's going to be very very hard to leave that. Um, and if someone's threatening it, you might have to defend it with force. Uh, you'll probably have to defend it with force, right? Uh, you know that's that's always on the table. Um, well, with the te- with temporary autonomous zones, uh, van nomadism, you know, sailboat living on a sailboat, um, it, these mobile lifestyles, well, you can just leave. It's a, it's a you know Taz is a peaceful solution. Um, next, exchanging information is the foundation of the Taz. Um, then uh, Hakim talks a little bit about uh, psychological liberation and psychic nomadism. Um, and uh, yeah, Kyle and I have a good, good, good discussion on that, so that I think you guys will enjoy. And then lastly, uh, for that episode, uh, digital, uh, digital Tazes. Um, thanks to uh, innovations uh, with technology and, uh, and, and internet communications. And then uh, uh, second, uh, the, the second episode in that series, which again, this is just going to be released as one part. Uh, it'll be a couple hour episode in total. But uh, um, some things we, we discuss in this section, uh, you'll know it's a PAS when you see it. Um, we talk a little bit about uh, PAS access, uh, freedom of association and disassociation. Um, like it, do- it typically doesn't work well. Like if you just have an open homestead, you know, available to anyone, you should probably do some vetting um, and not just let every, well, not let anyone come. Uh, so we spent some time talking about that. Uh, alternative and underground economies, uh, linking ethical enclaves. Uh, the PAS is a node for self-liberators. Um, the idea of PAS is, uh, I guess the underlying concept, the underlying theme is live in utopia now despite the risk. Because um, there, are, there are a lot more risks that come with passes, or I guess maybe a different set of risks. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we kind of conclude uh, the conclude the episode with uh, um, J. Neil Shulman actually commented on Kyle's mirroring um, of uh, Hakeem Bay's Taz article. Uh, and it was a conversation about Vanu Agorism, Taz is conk, and I won't go too much into that here. Um, but uh, that was uh, an interesting, again, interesting surprise that I totally forgot about. And then, uh, yeah, we, we, we conclude the episode, conclude the, we conclude uh, basically with our overall takeaways on the strategies and basically, yeah, we, we end the, we end the show talking about, uh, you know, use of force issues. And, uh, um, basically, uh, I, I really liked, and, and, and I'll preface this episode with it, but, um, Kyle, uh, uh, he, he, uh, paraphrased a, he, he paraphrased a quote from somebody. Um, and the idea was that grown up libertarianism comes down to defending property rights with guns. And I really, really like that. And that is the idea of a pass. It's the idea of this homestead is, you know, the land that I will defend, right? Like this is, this is where, this is where I'm making my stand. Um, and that's, no, I don't know what I'm saying, but um, that's the idea with uh, permanent autonomous zones and, and uh, grown-up libertarianism coming down to defending property rights with guns. Um, so it's a really fascinating discussion, really, really great episode. Um, and it's, it feels weird saying that about my own podcast. But again, like I go back and listen to some of these and, and I'm re-releasing them because I, I forgot... I don't know why. I, I don't know why I forget, but um, I, I, I do. I do plan on uh, over the course of the next uh, next few months um, releasing uh, um, releasing uh, the building the second realm in its entirety uh, on the Volney podcast uh, uh, podcast feed. So um, it's just yeah, really really valuable stuff, and, and it's it's very very relevant, and might as well uh, you know put it on a on a, on a different podcast feed on a different server um, for redundancy purposes. Uh, you know, back to. <laughs> back to uh to Devanu um and all that uh, always always a Vanu application so i think that's all i have for you guys right now again this is from uh, february 25th march for, uh, from episodes uh from leway radio uh, february 25th and march 4th of 2018 so keep that in mind with some of the references and uh, uh some of the things that we bring up um but again i mean i i, <clears throat> I thought i was thought i was done but one other comment here but uh, I, I I forgot how much I enjoyed talking to Kyle and uh, how much I enjoyed um, you know some of the some of the discussion some of the examples that he brings up um, and just uh, I guess some of some of the things that he that he that he brought to the table whenever he was uh, you know on the podcast so I think you guys will enjoy that as well um, there's some really really powerful stuff in here um, that it certainly relates to today. Yeah, I guess that's it. I guess that's it. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, LibertyInterTact.com for all of your anarchist books. Um, if you're an author looking for publishing services, anything like that, LibertyInterTact.com. Um, we've uh, we've got you covered there. And uh, also, VolniPodcast.com for all sorts of free resources, free books, um, podcast feed, all of our episodes, everything that you that everything there. Um, and then also Va- the Vonny Resistance Reports, uh, which is the newest project I'm working on. Um, that first one is out. Uh, just go to VolniPodcast.com forward slash resistance um, to learn more about that. 
Um, and then uh, just go to the main pay- main website, vanupodcast.com, and you'll find um, the uh, the first installment um, of that there. Second one will be out in the next couple few days. So I think that's all I've got for you guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you want to support the podcast, uh, you can find ways to do that, vanupodcast.com. Certainly do appreciate that. Uh, and until next time, um, always remember, Bonnie was yours for the making. So temporary autonomous zones, Taz's. Geographically mobile areas wherein individuals can exercise their autonomy to the fullest outside of state control or servile society cultural influence. Uh, so those are TASs. Uh, Van Nomadism, that's, that's a bunch of different TASs. Um, freedom festivals, those are temporary autonomous zones. They aren't there all the time. They're, uh, you know, the, the, attendants, the attendees of the festival only, uh, I guess, uh, exist in that space for just uh, for a weekend. So it's, it's definitely a temporary autonomous zone. Well, and the key thing is is on temporary, right? It's it's mobile. It's, I mean, even some of the uh, the uh, agorist literature mentions uh, tazes, uh, whether it's what the, like, yeah, you know, what the what the state can't what the Kate state can't find, they can't go worse. So. Exactly. So whether it's in the form of, uh, for example, like the novella hashtag agora, or it's uh, the nonfiction, uh, the second realm. Uh, you know, book on strategy and such. Um, you know, Taz's are are. I personally think it's pretty much where it's at, at least in in this time period. So, um, not saying it couldn't go into the direction of Paz's, which will be defined here shortly. I'm just simply saying that in terms of people doing direct action today, um, the barrier to entry is virtually non-existent. The only reason people don't do Taz's is because they're still stuck on uh, reformism and 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 playing games with. Um, uh, basically trying to force the state to be their own personal billy club and all that kind of stuff, which we've covered at length before in previous episodes. So that that's that's pretty much that. I mean, if people really wanted to have temporary autonomous zones, they would have done it already. Right, yeah, and, and th- th- some of them definitely do exist. They definitely do exist. So permanent autonomous zones, passes. Geographically fixed areas, such as intentional communities, permaculture farms, uh, etc., wherein individuals exercise their autonomy, yet run into the risk of state interference. Passes can serve as nodes for a TAS-based mobile community. So uh, there's a couple elements at play there, and I'll start with the last one. That, uh, um, I've, I've kind of had this idea, and actually it wasn't my idea, it was Jamie McConaughey's. He said... Uh, he said one thing kind of missing, you know, that he saw in, in Rayo's, uh, in, in, I guess in Rayo's journey was, you know, there wasn't, he had to go back to the Cerebral Society for food and Jamin thinks that's kind of stupid. And I kind of agree with him, right? I, I, I kind of agree with him. So the idea that Jamin brought to me was, um, you know, pr- different permaculture farms all over, say, the West or the Pacific Northwest, um, and then maybe into kind of the South, and then, you know, van nomads or uh, whatever type of nomads they are that are, you know, going to these uh, these passes, these they can, uh, you know, stop off. They can kind of, uh, you know, make the uh, make the journey, and they will always have uh, that uh, permaculture food. So uh, interesting, interesting stuff. Uh, so yeah, instead of uh, being temporary, they're definitely permanent. So that's the main difference between uh, tazes and passes. It's very self-explanatory. Temper. If are you are you existing in the space temporarily, or is it permanent? Um, and yeah, unfortunately, due to that fact, uh, you know, if there's uh, land purchased, you know, and so-called private property. Um, then yeah, uh, you have to pay, you have to pay property taxes. You'll open yourself up to coercion. So that's why, for me, I prefer Tazes uh, over Pazes because with Pazes you run into uh, a lot more risk. Yeah, and there are certain people that like to talk about like private cities, and then and I, I know on previous episodes of I think both LUA and TVP, I think we've kind of got into uh, kind of looking at uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of private cities and, and and related similar things along those lines, um, you know, free ports and such. Um, I, I would like at this point to kind of maybe very very quickly go through the uh, Wikipedia list of examples of passes because just 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 to make this really concrete, because passes are easier to conceive of in some sense where you're basically mobile I mean it's it's almost like basically being a gypsy would probably be the, the of one way of conceiving of it but passes are are a little bit harder so if you don't mind let's let's just quickly kind of go through that um, according to Wikipedia um, Freetown Christiania in Denmark specifically in a subset of Copenhagen is usually considered a pass that's kind of debatable for other reasons but that's what they list um, Dreamtime Village in southwestern Wisconsin is considered a pass for the most part. Um, there's uh, there's even actually probably and and then there's two other examples real quick. Um, the Zapatistas, for people who remember them from back in the '90s, who actually uh, actually took up arms against the Mexican federal government, uh, which actually is. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> those guys in Chiapas are pretty awesome. I don't like their economics, but um, I, I definitely appreciate their machismo and a couple other things because they they channel their machismo t- towards something actually productive. Um, and they actually freed a good chunks of Chiapas, and, and now they're just kind of in a ceasefire, uh, and it's pretty much been that way ever since. But yeah, the Zapatista Autonomous Municipalities, it's uh, that one's kind of debatable because it's more like a limited government type thing. Um, but some people have argued their passes and that they're on the list. So that one's kind of debatable. Although interestingly enough, for some reason, Rojava in Northern Syria is also considered a pass, but uh, I don't know. That's really strange. That's really strange because Rojava, uh, there are are a bunch of anarchists in Rojava though. There are. Well, that's why Amir Taki went out and fought against ISIS. Literally the, the the, the cryptocurrency programmer or just the, Uh the developer. Yeah, he uh-huh. went out and fought against ISIS with uh, with the people, with the anarchists of Rojava, because he wanted to inter- introduce them to Bitcoin. Uh, right. So it's pre- yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. But yeah, as a pass, strange. Yeah, that, that's kind of a strange one because uh, yeah, how, there how actually could a, is. How could a war zone be a pass? <laughs> well, it's not. Well, it's not even so much that, although that that's that's a mitigating factor that's that we can't ignore. I would say just just as a political science, you know, graduate or whatever, um, uh, there actually is the constitution of Rojava, and there is a Rojavan government that is not recognized by the so-called international community of uh, nation states populated by tyrants and so forth. Mm, okay. Um. So. So Rojava has a government formally organized. Well, you know, so let me let me just compare and contrast for a second. Whether the Zapatistas have a government or not is very debatable. So they could be a PAS, they could be a, like a limited government type thing. The Zapatistas, eh, they freed Chiapas and they're at a, they're, they they've had a ceasefire with the Mexican federal government. So their thing is kind of unclear. Other so so they would be closer to a PAS, I guess. But the Rojavans. The Rojavans have an actual government. They 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 were secessionists. They have a border that they've maintained. They are trying <laughs> to be a nation state, and so far they act like it. Um, and so yeah, it's a good thing that they really don't have any laws for the most part, and in, in terms of like um you know monopoly uh, legal services or whatever. So I guess that's a plus. But at that point, it's like well well then Freetown Christiania and Dreamtime Village in Denmark and Wisconsin respectively. Those would be more like a more like pure passes of sorts, and then the Zapatistas are kind of a weird in between one. But the Rojavans, as much as I like mm, the Rojavans, yeah. as much as I like the Rojavans, they really do have a government. Like there's a constitution and stuff. So well, I, I guess I guess maybe like you can have permanent autonomous zones that aren't uh, that like you can have passes within the United States, and they're still the United States government. So maybe the anarchists yeah. there are setting up their own passes inside Rojava, um, but there is uh, outside. That's their second realm. And the first realm is the Rojavan government. That's po- you know that's possible, but obviously to try and make decisions about that w- w- would be like another episode in itself, where we'd have to go through the nitty gritty and try and figure out what exactly the situation is there. Ideally, we, you know, getting some interviews with some of the Rojavans would be who can speak English uh, w- would be the ideal situation. But at least for now, just looking at different examples, what my point is this: it's a lot harder to find solid real world examples of what a permanent autonomous zone actually is in practice, as opposed to looking at actual real examples of temporary autonomous zones in in actual real practice. TASs are a lot easier to do and a lot more um, getting to the point of being more ubiquitous, as opposed to PASs, which really is kind of rocky at best, and that's on a good day. That's all I'm saying. Right, right. So, uh, so we're going to introduce uh, the concept of temporary autonomous zones and kind of just more of an overall introduction by Hakeem Bey. He says, quote, Are we who live in the present doomed never to experience autonomy, never to stand for one moment on a bit of land ruled only by freedom? Are we reduced either to nostalgia for the past or nostalgia for the future? Must we wait until the entire world is free to political control before even one of us can claim to know freedom? Logic and emotion unite to condemn such a supposition. Reason demands that one cannot struggle for what one does not know, and the heart revolts at a universe so cruel as to visit such injustices on our generations alone, on our generation alone, uh, of humankind. To say that, quote, I will not be free till all humans or all sentient creatures are free, end quote, is simply to cave into a kind of nirvana stupor, to abdicate our humanity, to define ourselves as losers. I believe that by I, I believe that by extrapolating from past and future stories about islands and the net, we may collect evidence to suggest that a, a certain kind of free enclave is not only possible in our time, but also existent. All my research and speculation has crystallized around the concept of temporary autonomous zone, uh, hereby abbreviated TAS. 
Despite its synthesizing force uh, for my own thinking, however, I don't intend the Taz to be taken as more than an essay attempt, a suggestion, almost a poetic fancy. Despite the occasional ranterish enthusiasm of my language, I'm not trying to construct political dogma. In fact, I have deliberately refrained from defining the TAS. I circle around the subject, firing, firing off ex uh, exploratory beams. In the end, the TAS is almost self-explanatory. If the phrase became current, it would be understood without difficulty. Understood in action, end quote. Uh, so that's kind of introducing the concept. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the first point I want to mention is that, uh, you know, TASs, Temporary Autonomous Zones, those are festivals like the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest or Anarchon uh, in Virginia put on by Liberate RVA. Uh, the TAS is, you know, it can be a, a freedom festival. Uh, it can be a rave, you know, uh, you know the, what those uh, young kids are doing, going and taking drugs and, you know, partying to uh, electronic music. Yeah, uh, you know, those are Temporary Autonomous Zones. They are. Uh, some more invulnerable to coercion than others, sure. Some more spontaneous, uh, you know, not like, uh, you know, every single night nightclubs. But um, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting examples of Taz's now. Uh, there, there, there really are. Uh, I guess some other ones are the uh, the RTR crew, the uh, the mother, I guess the yearly meetup that uh, van nomads out there in the in the desert somewhere in the West. That's definitely a Taz, and uh, it's there's there's a lot of them that exist today. There really are. You know, when you were saying that, I, I was thinking about history and, you know, those speakeasies back, I think it was in the 20s during uh, alcohol prohibition. You know, uh, you know, a lot of those places, you know, in, in some ways, I guess they were in some sense, they were Taz's, too, because whenever the, the bludgies would raid those speakeasies, people had to, like, kind of scatter out. And that was really the only form of protection. So, like early detection systems were actually rather important in, in, in one way. It's, although they didn't have a really a lot of technology relative to us in this time period, they had the kind of the idea down. And even in the second round book on strategy, they kind of mentioned something like, we need better early detection systems so we can evacuate everybody. So the TAS and the second realm is, is in a lot of ways more similar than not. However, you're right in saying that TAS is, as a concept is geared more towards festivities, almost a carnival atmosphere in some sense, where you're, you're going there to have fun, but also trade, uh, maybe even get laid, uh, or, or maybe some other things. Um, again, if it's a free market, you know, individuals have different desires, different interests, different demands, and there's yep. different supplies of things. So, you know, some people might want to get high. Some people may, uh, may maybe even even maybe something that emulates uh, a little bit more uh, more mainstream in some ways, like playing video games or something. I don't know, or or board games. I mean, people have different people have different interests, uh, but it's but it's really not going to be uh, closed off too much. I mean. I would suspect that certain things that have been pushed down, squeezed out, uh, prohibited in the first realm uh, would, would pretty much come out uh, during a TAS, at least to some degree. So I'm not oh, yeah. really all that surprised. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. So I guess just uh, I guess one other note there. And, uh, you know, just due to, you know, as as in depth we've gotten on LUA and also Vanu, uh, I'm not going to you know go into this too much. But <clears throat> I guess the, the philosophical reasons why people say these sorts of things. But. I guess maybe the psychological reasons, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, will, I will not be free to all humans or sentient creatures are free. I mean, that's, uh, that's a really, it's a kind of a shitty life. It really is. It's, it's, it almost, almost sounds some like well-meaning leftist back during when Bush Jr. was president. I remember some of them saying stuff like that too. And, and, and I, I even talked to a few of them back then, like when I was in college and said, you know, you could just kind of start slowly, you know, kind of pushing back against the system by, you know, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I was mainly and, doing and culture jamming and at the time. And thankfully, since then, that's changed a little bit, right? With the tiny house yeah. movement, with uh, Van yeah. Nomad, the Van Nomad movement, that's yeah. uh, motivated kind of by, uh, I guess, leftist aspirations. But st but still, you know, they, yes. they had that yes. they had that phase of, uh, you know, well, you know, we... I, yeah, we've we've it got was to, political we, we've crusading. Got to, yeah, we, we've got to fix things so everyone's free. We can't, uh, you know, we can't just leave our fellow man behind. And then eventually they said, okay, uh, you know, this is better on the environment. This is a more frugal lifestyle, uh, consuming less, uh, and uh, you know, I can travel and do all the things that I want to do. Uh, my time, my my time is my own. And they said, okay, well, I can go be free and I can help the environment and I can also, you know, start a YouTube channel and talk to people about this this great thing. And, uh, you know, I can help save people that way. Uh, so that's kind of, I think that's kind of the, the approach now. And I think that's a much better one, uh, even if there is kind of that, uh, the, um, the appeal to emotion sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Kind of the, the collective movement aspect. Uh, they're still partaking in direct action. So I think that's definitely 
definitely a positive. Oh, I think there's been a sea change with with more of the well-meaning leftists that that I've known and such. Where uh, you're right, they've pretty much have gone from the political crusading, the more pure version of that. They've gone from political crusading towards direct action. And yes, they're still kind of the leftover, controlled schizophrenia, and even the collective movementism, at least to some degree. But in terms of shades of gray, I would say as a whole, from what I can tell, just from my little you know analyst chair, so to speak, I would say there's a lot less of that. Um, I mean, yeah, they'll, they'll mention it. They'll call it a tiny house movement, but it's, it's not even, but it, it's hard for, it's hard to really say that's a movement because it's not right. like a, like a collective movement. Like we're going to go out here and protest. We're going to get together and there's and no this. organizations. And there's no, we're going to have a movement and go to our separate houses. Huh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, right. And my favorite part is even, even as a collective movement, even possibly, from what I can tell, they don't really have any of the weaknesses that I've written about before uh, regarding, you know, collective movement uh, movementism where they basically are selling out their own people and they're being hypocrites. No, I mean, the closest thing is that they have it, the, the relationships they have are more peer to peer. So there's no like and here's the other thing. There's no formal organizations for like tiny home people. Again, just to be clear to everybody. I am not advocating that thing. In fact, I'm saying don't do that. But if you look at how they actually act. It's very much peer to peer for the most part, which I think is good. And in some ways, I think they're kind of avoiding what some of the Bitcoiners have kind of fallen into, where they've yeah, been more, doing the whole organization. Yeah. Well, some of the more uh, Bitcoiners who want, uh, you know, uh, government regulation of cryptocurrencies Fair for enough, some god awful yeah. reason, are very much doing the collective movementism thing, and even going one more step, and even doing downright political crusading. So, in some ways, I think the tiny house people are on a better track. Uh, in terms of direct action, but then of course, to be fair, a lot of Bitcoiners don't like uh, the the, lo the lobbyists and so forth. Um, but what I'm saying is, I kind of compare and contrasting some of these. Um, yeah, I mean, the idea is that the trend towards more lifestyle changes, the trend towards more decentralized uh, activities in general, I think is very very healthy. And for those of us in um, the alternative media or even the free media. Uh, I, anything that we can proselytize or advocate for is more of that kind of thing. I, you know, people taking responsibility for their own lifestyle choices and encouraging them to do more and more direct action where they can help their fellow men and trade and all that. So I guess let's go ahead and get on to this next ex excerpt here. We're about an hour through, so um, we can stop and talk about whatever, but I'm going to go ahead and read the second excerpt. Uh, it's about the, uh, the net or the web. Quote, the present forms of the unofficial web are, one must suppose, still rather primitive. The marginal z uh, zine network, the BBS networks, pirated software, hacking, phone breaking, or phone freaking, uh, some influence in print and radio, almost none in the other big media, no TV stations, no satellites, no fiber optics, no cable, etc., etc. However, the net itself presents a pattern of changing and evolving relations between subjects, users, and objects' data. The nature of these relations has been exhaustively explored from McLuhan to Virilio. It would take these. It would. It would take pages and pages to prove what by now everyone knows. Rather than rehash it all, I'm interested in asking how these uh, evolving relations suggest modes of Im implementation uh, for the TAS. Uh, ellipses. At this moment in the evolution of the web, and considering our demands for the face-to-face -face and the sensual, we must consider the web primarily as a support system capable of carrying information from one TAS to another, of defending the TAS, rendering it invisible or giving it teeth as a situation might demand. But more than that, if the Taz is a no-bad camp, then the web helps provide the epics, songs, genealogies, and legends of the tribe. It provides these secret caravan routes and raiding trails which make up the flow lines of tribal economy. It even contains some of the very roads they will follow, some of the very dreams they will experience as signs and portents. Uh, ellipses, skipping just a little bit further. Uh, the story of computer networks, BBSs, and various other experiments in electro-democracy has so far been one of hobbyism for the most part. Many anarchists and libertarians have deep faith in the PC as a weapon of liberation and self-liberation, but no real gains to show, no palpable liberty. Uh, end quote. So back when he wrote this, which was in the 1990s, uh, I don't think he was necessarily wrong. Uh, I don't think he was necessarily wrong. Uh, but now it's gone beyond hobbyism, and it definitely is a tool of web. It's, it's definitely a weapon of liberation and self-liberation, uh, mainly, mainly with things like uh, like blockchain technology and uh, decentralization, things like that. So. I think he's uh it's an interesting it's an interesting way to tie in uh technology to temporary autonomous zones and he does provide some examples as to how uh the internet can facilitate uh some activities that Tazis will uh, partake in. Well, what he's really describing is what the first realm would call social media, isn't he? 
I mean, remember, this was written back in 1991. So he's kind of trying to kind of look out uh, at the current technology and kind of extrapolating from there. So, yeah, when you go, you can go from pretty much from BBS networks to um, some people would say fascist book. But I think a better example would be other forms of peer to peer. I mean, hell, Shane, even how Steam you it. and I steam it would, would be sure. a great example of that. Yeah. And you can get paid, but, too. Yeah. But even how you and I talk to each other, too. I mean, that I mean, we're using the Internet right now to kind of make this happen. So yep. that's yeah, that's that's something else that that I think, you know, uh, VoIP technology, prefer, you know, obviously the encrypted version of ZRTP is preferable, but sometimes that's not possible for other reasons. Um, but, yeah, that's 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 kind of the idea is essentially using uh, digital technology and computer networks to essentially facilitate the formation of uh, neo neo nomadic tribes in in one sense, um, which I think is not is not too bad because where else are you going to get your intentional communities from? Um, I would agree with him that you do need something. Uh, how did he put it? Considering our demands for the face to face and the sensual, we must consider the web primarily as a support system. So yeah, in other words, in order to actually have those intentional communities, which are you know physically together, you know we might have to actually use the internet. Basically, I mean, like, what is the internet? I mean, basically, what it really is is a communicate is a telecommunications and data retrieval system. That being said. Uh, it's very invaluable because like uh, do how Dr. Mikio Kaku described it, who's a theoretical physicist who I've read s several of his books and I even did a book report on one of them. Um, he basically described the internet as a primitive version of a type one uh, civilization's telephone system, which is basically global. Um, that's more or less accurate, I suppose, because I've been able to talk to people who are in Ireland and I didn't have to like have nasty phone charges and so forth for international calls because of how VoIP technology works. So that's not, uh, completely crazy that maybe perhaps using the internet such as it is and even better versions of the internet, especially, uh, the more encrypted it can get can actually help facilitate people to actually come together in a physical way. Hell, you want to look at like flash mobs? Or, or, or flash dancing or, or versions on a theme of those kind of things. A lot of that stuff was done through what the first realm would call social media, where people coordinating. Yes, even if they did it over Twitter, which is something I don't recommend. But there's alternatives to the more mainstream websites where you can still kind of connect with people, uh, even if it was something like like Signal or Telegram or, or, or one of those other apps that, that at least is pri trying to be a privacy enhancing technology. A PET, if you will. So I think Hakeem Bey was trying to kind of extrapolate from the current technology that was available back in 91 and trying to see how could that facilitate uh, people essentially coming together and building uh, communities of any kind. And now we're in, uh, let's see, the year of our Lord 2018, so to speak. Um, I, I think it's rather interesting to see how that's kind of come to fruition. Um, however, I, I do have an however, and obviously I don't think you could really foresee this. Notice also, too, how pe uh, people have abused the Internet when you look at things like doxing or you look at – the promotion and even advocacy and the f facilitation and enabling of things like political crusading vis-a-vis so-called social media, uh, such as getting on fascist book and say, you know, vote for my uh, political uh, candidate authoritarian of the week kind of thing. So Yeah, and, and, the, and the internet mainly being used for most folks is being a tool for entertainment, and rarely I'll do that. I'll do that sometimes, but uh, the, there's, there's, so much, like, there's so much information there, and people just uh, – a lot of people aren't self-directed uh, learners, so – Right, uh, and so, so that's yeah, that's not, that's definitely a miss. I, 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 I'm not necessarily a misuse, but um, it's unfortunate that the internet's not being used for that by a lot of folks. Right, and so there is a potential to use it more along the lines of Hakeem Bay was kind of pushing for, and and others. But that's not that's not a failure of technology. What that is a failure of is is uh, people's uh, lack of desire for freedom or even vanu uh, at that point where they don't really want to be as the mainstream parlance goes. They don't want to be free. Uh, they want to be slaves. They like slavery and so forth. And I'm I'm going to call and call a spade a spade because when you're paying taxes, when you're subjected to a fiat currency that gets debased and inflated beyond recognition, you are a slave. The only different version is that it's the democratic version of slavery where you have the hypothetical freedom to choose your own occupation instead of the ancient Egyptian model of slavery where there's whips and chains. It's still slavery. Call it what it is. But people are in – but most of mainstream people are in denial about it. I see it all the time when I go to work. 
So, I mean, this is, I mean, this is, so when people not to get spiritual on you, because Hakeem Bey has plenty of that in, in his, in his articles, but you have to look at where people's consciousness is, or maybe a better way of putting it is you have to look at where their maturity really is. And I would argue actual adults recognize the real threats to their liberty uh, in you know by the state, and they are acting accordingly. But then again, I don't think most people are grown up adults, as as far as I can tell. Right, Not the ones right. I can cross. Yeah, yeah, and I think we're we're a step further now that uh, these tasks could be facilitated on a uh, on a blockchain. Anyways, anyways, uh, let's go ahead and move forward here. So the uh, uh, third excerpt, uh, point number two, gone to Croatan. Uh, so Kyle, whenever uh, I was preparing for this episode by reading, uh, you know, his article, you pointed to this section as being the most significant. Uh, so why is that? I guess uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, yeah, why why is it important? Okay, I personally, in my subjective valuation, consider this the most important: the idea of gone to Croatan, which you could argue is maybe a more uh, a more serious version of go- of you know gone fishing. Uh, might be it might be an easy relatable way of thinking about it, uh, but going to Croton is a, it's more of a permanent one way thing where you really are abandoning uh, this 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 so called wonderful notion of Western civilization uh, such as has become corrupted in, in the way that it has uh, pretty much widespread globally and such. You're pretty much and 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 so forth. Well, and I guess I guess maybe more of a more of a somewhat more historically accurate way of putting it, which will segue nicely into what you're about to read here, is when you had like the first colonists come to this continent, they were trying to get away from Europe. They were trying to get away from the monarchs that were there. They were trying to get away from the authoritarianism that ruined their lives and and enabled a and encouraged the formation of a strict class system, especially in England, which is not entirely different from the caste system in India. So, you know, again, the more things change, the more they stay the same in some sense. So you have the, you have those people from Europe who who honestly were looking for any even a smidgen of freedom who risked their lives to get across the Atlantic and and many of them died, but of the ones who survived they got here, and yeah they would set up there would be the official uh, co- colonial charters for like a certain colony or whatever but then at some point but then there were different people who just said screw this I'm gonna go native. So the notion of gone to Croatan is is a more uh, specific way of saying going native or gone native. And it's very interesting that anybody who goes native and even to the extent of, you know, falling in love and reproducing, shall we say, mixed what some people would consider mixed children. What about uh, off grid homesteading? Well, that would count, too. Um, but anybody who basically tries to get away from that first realm in any respect is pretty much demonized um, as extremists, as radicals, as criminals, as uh, all sorts of nasty labels of, of one kind or another. And that's and that's because they're basically thumbing their nose at, at how Western civilization has become corrupted such as it is. Um, that's just bottom line what it is. And so, yes, the, uh, the notion of what you're about to read here about uh, the gray-eyed Indians – uh, and versions on a theme thereof are are basically, and that's and that's I think why uh, the very existentiality of people who are usually considered by anthropologists to be ethnically mixed is the hard proof that there are people who sincerely got away from from Europe and really kind of repudiated European authoritarianism and and the nas and again it's not even so much the colon- the, the 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 so-called uh, colonialism that the left likes to make a point of, likes to like demonize or whatever uh, use it as a straw man it's not even so much that it's the entire colossal leviathan that's the issue so even if there was never was a colonial period with colonialism and and all sorts of atrocity against native folks even if that never happened that doesn't therefore exonerate the state from how they oppress their own people back in england or france or germany or pick a place so you basically have people fleeing, fleeing these monarchies, fleeing these what are now considered to be parliamentary democracies and all their 20 million thousand problems or whatever. And so, yeah, going to Croatan is a repudiation of all of it, as far as I can tell. Right, right. So let's go ahead and uh, get to it. Quote, we were taught in elementary school that the first settlements in Roanoke failed. The uh, colonists disappeared, leaving behind them only the cryptic message, gone to Croatan. 
Later reports of gray-eyed Indians were dismissed as legend. What really happened, the textbook implied, was that the Indians massacred the defenseless settlers. However, Croatan was not some El Dorado. It was the name of a neighboring tribe of friendly Indians. Apparently, the settlement was simply moved back from the coast into the Great Dismal Swamp and, they, and, and absorbed into the tribe. And the gray-eyed Indians were uh, real. They're still there, and they still call themselves Croatans. So the first, very, the very first colony in the New World chose to renounce its contract with Prospero, D. Rowley, and Empire, and go over to the Wild Men with Caliban. They dropped out. They became Indians, went native, opted for chaos over the appalling miseries of surfing, uh, S.E.R.F., uh, for the plutocrats and, 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 and intellectuals of London. As America came into being where once there had been Turtle Island, Croatan remained embedded in its collective, in its collective psyche. Out beyond the frontier, the state of nature, i.e. no state, still prevailed, and within the consciousness of these settlers, the option of wilderness always lurked. The temptation to give up on church, farm work, literacy, taxes, all the burdens of civilization and go to Croatan, or some way or another, in some way or another. Moreover, as the revolution in England was betrayed, first by Cromwell and then by, the, by, by Restoration, waves of Protestant radicals fled or were transported into the New World, uh, which had now become a prison, a place of exile. Antinomians, familias, rogue Quakers, levelers, diggers, and ranters were now introduced to the occult shadow of wilderness and rushed to embrace it, end quote. Uh, so yeah, I think you put you, you basically laid out a very good uh, explanation for what, he, what he's talking about here. Uh, that's, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, and so basically anybody who thumbs their nose at uh, uh, corrupt Western uh, values of whatever kind, whether it comes from the state or even the mainstream culture, is, is basically demonized. And again, it wasn't just the Croatans. Um, just very briefly, Hakeem Bey also kind of goes and, and gives some other examples, whether it would be the Buccaneers, uh, the Maroons, um, I think the Rompogs of northern New Jersey, uh, some people that might be considered like the Moors of Delaware and the Bene Ishmalis who migrated from Kentucky to Ohio in the mid-18th century. What I'm trying to get at is this. There are all sorts of different kinds of people's plural that live on this continent. Some of them get along, some of them don't. But they each have their own unique identities, whether uh, whether that is ethnically based or not. However, each one of them is a is considered a threat to the first realm because they refuse to play the homogenous. Uh, let's all wear the diversity t-shirt game that leftism likes to promote so much specifically. So, you know, so when you have certain uh, even authoritarian conservatives basically try to be a little bit, have a little bit of integrity and try to try to basically make suggestions like, well, maybe we should like, you know, kind of segregate off and have, you know, have communities with very restrictive covenants. There's a reason why the first realm really kind of recoils at that because they never want anybody to escape. They never want anybody to escape. And so whether it would yep. be people of a more conservative uh, leaning or it's people who are more uh, like the American Indian, uh, various different types of American Indians, whether it be the Cherokee, the Apache, uh, the Mandans, the uh, you know anybody else I forgot. Sorry, there's a lot. There's a lot of different different peoples, uh, plural, that lived here and still live here. Uh, there's just a lot less of them because, well, they threaten the power structure, and that's why there's less of them. Frankly, uh, some of them I'm actually I'm 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 more likely than not related to. Um, I, I so yeah, I do take it a little bit personally, frankly, um, because basically the government murdered some distant relatives of mine. And frankly, at this and, and and then I'm supposed to be grateful because they try to extend to me, you know, a, a while back uh, that maybe I should, you know, sign up with the BIA and and see maybe if I can get some government handouts. I mean, that that's just insulting, frankly. Um, they can frankly go to hell. And so part of that attitude of the first round can go to hell is, well, maybe we can, you know, go on to Croatan, not have a revolution, not. Uh, take up arms and try to kill all these authoritarians, but rather let's maybe kind of segregate off and try to be, live as peaceably as possible without being subjected to 20,000 different laws and driver's licenses and taxes and central banking and the bludgies and on and on and on, the entire you know list of grievances, so to speak. Um, this is a peace, peaceful solution, by the way, for anybody who uh, doesn't like to think strategically. Uh, this is a peaceful solution of going to Croatan, where you essentially go native. Um, and so far, it seems to be at least 
at least partially efficacious for anybody who bothered to try. Yeah, um, yeah, I, it's, I it's, guess it's leave, leaving behind that uh, first realm and creating a second realm. Exactly. It's it's a different way of doing it, but but yeah, it's it's one way of doing it for sure. Right, right. So uh, um, this is the last excerpt for the Taz portion, and then we'll talk about Paz's. Moving a little, moving a little quickly, but uh, I, I think it's quite evident what we're trying to get across here. Uh, and you can obviously go and read these, uh, and I, I do recommend you do. Uh, I'll put them in the show notes. Go read uh, both of these essays by uh, Hakeem Bay. So excerpt number four: Rat holes in the Babylon of information. Quote: The Taz is a conscious radical tactic. Uh, uh, the Taz, as a conscious radical tactic, will emerge under certain conditions. One, psychological liberation. That is, we must realize, make real, the moments and spaces in which freedom is not only possible, but actual. We must know in what ways we are genuinely oppressed and also in what ways we are self-repressed or ensnared in a fantasy in which ideas oppress us. Work, for example, is a far more actual, far more actual source of misery for most of us in legislative politics. Alienation is far more dangerous for us than toothless, outdated, dying ideologies. Mental addiction to ideals, which in fact turn out to be more projections of our resentment and sensations of victimization. We'll, uh, we'll never further our project. The Taz is not a harbinger of some pie-in-the-sky social utopia to which we must sacrifice our lives, that are, our lives that our children's children may breathe a bit of free air. The Taz must be the scene of our present autonomy, but it can only exist on the condition that we already know ourselves as free beings. Number two, the counternet must expand. At present, it reflects more abstraction than actuality. Zines and BBSs, BBSs exchange information, which is part of the necessary groundwork of the TAS, but very little of this information relates to, relates to concrete goods and services necessary for the autonomous life. We do not live in cyberspace. To dream that we do is to fall into cybernosis, the false transcendence of the body. The TAS is a physical place, and we are either in it or not. All the senses must be involved. The web is like a new sense in some ways, but it must be added to the others. The others must not be subtracted from it, as in some horrible parody of the mystic trance. Without the, web, without the web, the full realization of the Taz complex would be impossible, but the web is not the end itself, it's a weapon. Number three, the apparatus of control, the state, must, or so we must assume, continue to deliquesce and petrify simultaneously, must progress on its present course in which hysterical rigidity comes more and more to mask a vacuity as an abyss of, pow uh, <clears throat> an abyss of power. As power disappears, our, our will to power must be disappearance. And uh, Ellipsy's moving forward just a little bit. Uh, let, us admit, let us admit that we have attended parties where for one brief night, a republic of gratified desires was attained. Shall we not confess that the politics of that night might have more reality and force, us, and force for us than those, of, than those of, say, the entire U.S. government? Some of the parties we've mentioned lasted for two or three years. Is this something worth imagining, worth fighting for? Let us study invisibility web working, psychic nomadism, and who knows what, what we might attain, uh, end quote. So there's a lot to uh, unpack there. Uh, there really is. So that's uh, that first thing, psychological liberation. And this is something that when I first became an anarchist, I was definitely more of uh, the hard anarchist variety uh, because I didn't really want to look at the spirituality, uh, kind of uh, spirituality, kind of the psychological, emotional side at all, you know, you know, the, the state exists. Let's examine how, uh, you know, its actions uh, and, you know, Hopefully, you know, uh, bring more people to anarchism, you know, show them the truth about the state. Yeah, but I, now I, I do think that's kind of important because even if um, even if these folks are anarchists and they want to create second realms, having, you know, really damaged people in these spaces might not be a good idea. Right. Um, so obviously the physical freedom is important, but that kind of mental psychological freedom is absolutely crucial too. Uh, you know, where you exercise your demons, you exercise your collectivist spooks and you exercise all of those things that are harmful to you, uh, and harmful to your freedom. Yeah. Let's, let's not, let's not encourage controlled schizophrenia. Let's in fact, try to cure it as, as much as possible for those people who actually want to be cured of controlled schizophrenia. Right. I mean, I, I think that's kind of, that's kind of the starting point at, at bare minimum. Yes. You know, when, 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 when Hakeem Bey was mentioning about, we must know in what ways we are genuinely oppressed, not the fake uh, oppression that the left likes to make a point about, but genuinely oppressed, <clears throat> civil asset forfeiture being one. And also in way, what ways we are self-oppressed or ensnared in a fantasy in which ideas oppress us. That's interesting. That he sounds just like Sam Konkin in the Agoras Primer. Because remember, he was mentioned. Uh, Sam Konkin mentioned something about along the lines of you know exorcising the collectivist spooks. He didn't phrase it like that, but it was something along those lines. And Hakeem Bey is saying something similar here, isn't he? Because uh, I mm -hmm. think Konkin mentioned something about you know maybe if not necessarily therapy, but but some version of either alone or in groups, 
you know, ro- or as Rayo put it, ro- rooting out the outposts, I think. So you have right. these different guys in these different time periods expressing more or less the same idea, but explaining it in different ways and different flavors, different angles of looking at uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak, which I think which I think is is more reliable than not, because they're actually kind of pointing to something that I think is probably true. Uh, something else I want to point out real quick when. Hakeem Bey then says in the next sentence about work, for example, is a former actual source of misery for most of us than legislative politics. What I think he's referring to is is more uh, the corporate America drudgery, like with one of my employers that I've been very vocal about in terms of how much I don't like working there. Um, I think that's more relative than not. Again, my two other employers are pretty okay. Um, but I would halfway agree with, with, with Hakeem here that depending on your employer, it could actually be a real more source of misery than the latest awful thing the state did this week. That's very much case by case basis. Um, he's right in the sense that it's, it's more of a daily reality if you are, you know, basically being treated like irresponsible little brat, even though, even if the lower management admits you did nothing wrong, which has been my experience so far. Uh, but then again, with my other employers, they don't have a problem with anything. So it, it's really, it depends what your own specific situation is. And then of course, the cherry on top of that is, well, if you're pursuing financial independence, early retirement, and, or you're an entrepreneur, you can basically hop, skip, jump over all of that. So, um, I, I guess Hakeem has a little bit of a bias here in some ways in terms of work. Well, work could also be an entrepreneur too. Um, so where is he going with that? I, so that's why I'm assuming he's talking about, about more like corporate bureaucracy and things more along those lines. But again, that's an assumption I'm making. He didn't actually say that though. Um, so, you know, I am, I, I, I hope he's not getting big on the whole trade unionism bandwagon and all that. Uh, I'm possible. I'm, I'm but, guessing it's, I'm guessing it's more like Konkin where it's, it's about entrepreneurs, not, you know, working for a, a corporate bureaucracy. Yeah. Um, but being so an entrepreneur I, I, yeah. is work though. But, but being an entrepreneur is work though. Let's be honest. So, uh, True, but if it's sure a where... source of happiness and not misery, then it wouldn't apply to what he's saying here. Fair enough, which is why I'm making the assumption he's talking more about like the, the, the corporate, you know, government state thing or whatever. Um, and the next sentence, too, is interesting. Alienation is far more dangerous for us than toothless, outdated, dying ideologies. I can't tell you how many times my coworkers at all of my jobs keep talking about how much they feel alienated. It is fucking amazing. And apparently one of the reasons why they like talking to me is for whatever reason, and several of them have said this, even just by talking to me in a, you know, our very platonic way, um, they feel less alone. So I think Hakeem really hit on something really poignant there. Because if he's saying this back in 1991 and I have coworkers and, you know, in and, and, and 2018 saying this kind of uh, – basically explaining how they feel so le- feel less alone when I talk to them for all of like f- less than five minutes in between other things, um, that's, that's a sign of the times, ain't it, in some sense? All right. So in that second uh, – I guess in that second uh, – uh, the second item in that list was, uh, was interesting. He says that at present it reflects more abstraction than actuality. Uh, zines and BBSs exchange information, which is part of the necessary groundwork of the TAS, but very little of this information relates to concrete goods and services necessary for the autonomous life. That has definitely advanced. Uh, you know, I think this, the, yeah. this, the the folks of uh, the authors of uh, Second Round Book on Strategy, uh, you know, they talk about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, these TASs can now exist in cyberspace because the, the products and services do exist necessary for autonomous, for the autonomous life. And most of that is done, you know, via encryption, uh, digital currencies, things like the deep web, open bazaar, uh, that, that, that sort of thing. And then also more, more along the lines of like I2P and uh, IRC chats and things like that. Yeah. The, what he, he was definitely, I'm, I'm sure he was correct in, in the 1990s, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, where, where all senses are, senses are involved. Yeah. All senses can be involved. Right. Um, at least to to a certain extent. So uh, I think we have that now. I think we have that now, and uh, all it takes uh, at, at this point is freedom pioneers to help develop develop uh, these these places, uh, and also you know actual physical places too, not just cyberspace. Agreed. Agreed. Nothing else. All right. Uh, let me see if there's anything else uh, pertinent from this uh, this portion. Um, uh, nothing else except, uh, you know, he says, without the web, the full realization of the TAS complex would be impossible. I definitely agree, uh, at least to a certain extent. Uh, you, you did have those temporary autonomous zones without the Internet. So 
So that is true. Um, but with the advent of the Internet and blockchain and things like that, uh, you know, TAS is, should should become far more commonplace. Uh, so I think that's uh, something positive to look for in the in the very near future. Uh, so this third uh, this third uh, uh, third item on the on his uh, list is uh, basically talking about. I guess basically that uh, as power disappears, our will to power must be disappearing. So we're just talking about, uh, uh, I guess, kind of the need for uh, the, the need for Tazis, right? That's kind of how I see it. Well, but notice his, his emphasis on our will to power must be disappearance. Well, that sounds a lot like old man Rayo, right? And Vanu yeah. and all that. Yeah. Ooh. I don't know. Did Hakeem Bey read Vanu, the search for personal freedom? I don't know. Maybe I a little so. bit. I think so. Maybe. Yeah, they were they wrote know. the same publications, and I think um, <laughs> I, I think if I remember correctly that uh, well, I, yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty positive. Yeah, pretty positive. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, I wouldn't either. I wouldn't either. So, so yeah, I guess that kind of concludes the uh, the, the the Taz portion. Do you have any uh, I guess any uh, closing thoughts for the listeners as as we wrap up this part one? I would simply say that temporary autonomous zones are much more practical than, uh, you know, political crusading and, and such. So just just to kind of, you know, repeat that one over again, I, I think that's pretty much just where it's at. You know, if you're serious about your freedom, liberty and or Vanu, then I would seriously start, start men suggesting that you do whatever you can to basically exercise a temporary autonomous zone beginning with yourself. And um, I, I keep in mind mobility, too. And if there are threats, uh, if the bludgies and such, then then move to where your autonomous zone, uh, temporary as it is, can still be maintained. Again, that's why that's the temporary in temporary autonomous zones, just to stress that one more time. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So I think... Uh, depending upon the length of the pass portion, which we should be able to get an hour out of it uh, easy, uh, you know, I think we might as well just go ahead and split these into two episodes. What do you think? I, I think we might have to uh, because yeah, it's about an hour and a half in already, and we haven't even touched the passes. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. I, I guess this is an impromptu part two. Oh, uh, uh oh, I've been talking too long again. How about that, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we've all come to, to know and love, Kyle, so don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Oh, so. shucks. <laughs> all right, so. Uh, so yeah, what we'll do is we'll, we'll close this out for now, and uh, we will return next week for the uh, for the PAS portion. All right, so let's get on to permanent autonomous zones, uh, Kyle. So uh, kind of the same format. I'll have excerpts and points, and we'll we'll read and discuss. So uh, excerpt number one, introduction. TAS theory tries to concern itself with existing or emerging situations rather than with pure utopianism. All over the world, people people are leaving or disappearing themselves from the grid of alienation uh, and seeking ways to restore human contact. An interesting example of this on the level of urban folk culture can be found in the proliferation of hobby networks and conferences. Uh, a little bit forward here, Taz theory realizes that this is happening. We're not talking about should or will be. We're talking about an already existing movement. Our use of various thought experiments, utopian poetics, paranoia, criticism, uh, etc., aims at helping to clarify this complex and still largely undocumented movement uh, to give it some theoretical focus and self-awareness and to suggest tactics based on coherent and uh, integral strategies to act the midwife or the panegyrist, not the vanguard, uh, end quote. So this kind of introduces it, right? Um, an, an interesting way to do so. Yeah, I I'd, I'd say so. Um I guess I guess and again remember this is the same guy Hakeem Bey who when he wrote about uh, Taz's or temporary autonomous zones originally he said I don't want to define it I'm fighting off exploratory beams or however he phrased it. Yep. And so regarding this further development of permanent autonomous zones I, I think he's kind of doing something similar right things he, haven't changed it's so vague it's so kind of <laughs> abstract it's it's how do, you, how do you put your finger on what he's talking about well you just you know it's permanent autonomous zones just think of it as the way that we defined it and uh, that'll help you understand what he's saying a little bit more I actually think. hold on could, maybe we should revisit the definitions just real quick for this part two maybe yep yep that's uh, not a bad idea not a bad idea let me scroll up here to it all right, so temporary autonomous zones, TAS, is our geographically mobile areas wherein individuals can exercise their autonomy to the fullest outside of state control or servile society cultural influence. Uh, so temporary autonomous zones, that's what those are. Uh, permanent autonomous zones, the subject of this episode, geographically fixed areas such as intentional communities, permacultural farms, uh, permaculture farms, etc., wherein, individual ex wherein individuals exercise their autonomy yet ruin, uh, yet run into the risk of state interference because, uh, you know, what the what the coercers can't find, they can't coerce. But if you have a property title, uh, then yeah, you're 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 opening yourself up to to, to some coercion. 
So um, those are the definitions. Again, I'm glad you brought that up because this is a separate episode. So we do need we uh, definitely need to revisit that after a week. So uh, I guess anything else at, uh, at this point? Well, well, again, I, I think Hakeem Bay is is similarly avoid deliberately avoiding defining what a permanent autonomous zone is because again, much you'll like n- with you'll Taz, know it when you see it is kind of what he's saying. Wait, that almost sounds like some uh, federal judges and all that, like regarding pornography. You know, right? you'll know it. that's actually the legal standard. <laughs> you'll know it when you see it, right? It's like, wow, really? I don't know. I would say a combination of naked people plus moaning plus things I'm not going to say because it, that would that would be you know getting into triple X almost type stuff. But let's just say not PG thirteen. Um, it's like uh, I, I think there's some there's some there's some definable elements I think we can kind of look at here, <laughs> and I would suggest kind of something similar for both uh, temporary autonomous zones and permanent autonomous zones that there are certain features that we can kind of you know go down the list as it were for both of them and kind of like oh okay so we don't have to uh play this little game of we'll know it when we <laughs> see it and sound like a federal judge or whatever trying to figure out what pornography is we can actually objectively determine as close as possible that okay that's a paz over there and that's a taz and you know we can actually try and be like scientific about this at least in some sense uh, all right so this next excerpt uh number two access alternative economy festivals living earth and PaaS typology. So we'll start with access first, and we'll, we'll discuss these uh, you know, one at a time. Uh, so quote, access. People probably ought to choose the people they live with. Open membership commun- communes invariably end up swamped with freeloaders and sex-starved pathetic creeps. Uh, an interesting choice of words. Uh, back to it. PaaSes <laughs> must choose their own membership mutually. This has nothing to do with elitism. The PaaS may exercise a temporarily open function, such as hosting festivals or giving away free food, etc., but it need not be permanently open to any self-proclaimed sympathizer who wanders by, end quote. So, you know, it's just enforcing those private property borders. That's extremely crucial uh, to the philosophy of the second realm. So I think that's uh, that's that's great. And it's also the freedom of association and freedom to not associate with folks that you don't want to. Uh, so I think it's a, a great start. Yeah, I mean, and and kind of like how I mentioned the previous episode, you know, kind of how like the authoritarian conservatives may very well when they're trying to be at least a little bit consistent and have a little bit of integrity when some of them have mentioned about maybe setting up uh, their own forms of intentional communities with that have very restrictive covenants um, regarding something more like a PAS, at least for some of them having maybe not a restrictive one, but maybe having something like a mm, looser covenant may not be necessarily a bad idea for for some of the passes. So, um, and again, it would, it would depend on what those details would be. But again, covenants actually do deal with issues of access, actually. So, uh, but then of course, uh, the the leftist totalitarians really uh, want to you know, force everybody to wear the diversity t-shirt because multiculturalism, because reasons, because safe spaces, because, 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 uh, because I said so, which is what it really comes down to because of course they're, they're status, they're authoritarians. Um, so yeah, when you look at issues of access, um, it, uh, it can also, it looks like, uh, we're talking about something that's probably, uh, politically incorrect, at least in some sense, right? Because, uh, you know, you're not yeah, allowed to have freedom racist, of association. Racist or sexist or something like that nowadays. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, so, and you, and you course, don't want to live with them? No, I'd rather not live. I'd rather not live next to a, you know, a violent, uh, anti propertarian psychopath. Sorry. Not, I don't really want to do that. Oh, you can't do that because such is because the private criminal is a trans person or whatever the lie of the week is, right? It's like, well, I'd be happy to live next to a trans person if they respect my private property. That's because you're you're obfuscating the issue, right? Would that that would be the actual rebuttal? But of course, um, that that that's that's kind of the problem with 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 leftism as a form of authoritarianism is that they basically kind of make this assumption that we all have to live in the public commons with everybody at all times. And if you don't like somebody else, that means you're a bigot, you're prejudiced, and you're just a bad person, and um, and you're not you're not willing to play the game and get along, and 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 uh, you know repeat the propaganda talking points of inclusion, right? Because they're basically saying that uh, you only have two choices: you either must support a genuinely uh, bigoted thing like like the Jim Crow laws or something, or which was coercive segregation. Or you have to support the coercive integration of things like busing and so forth. But never does voluntary association of any kind is allowed on the table because authoritarians don't think about anything that's voluntary, right? Everything has to be coercive, uh, whether it's done through the state or even other means. 
Um, that that's just kind of where they're coming from and always have been. Uh, but of course, they're cowards because unlike private criminals, they never actually want to take the responsibility uh, to uh, inflict coercion on others. They always want to kind of shift that responsibility sh uh, onto the state, act as their own personal billy club because otherwise they wouldn't be statists. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, I have nothing, uh, nothing to add there. But yeah, access, access. You don't have to have uh, open. Uh, you don't have to have open, so-called open borders. You don't have to. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, you know, uh, make it a closed event. Great, do it. It's your Taz. If they, if they don't like it, they can start their own. Or, yeah, Taz rather. <laughs> Taz rather. Yeah. If they don't like, yeah. If they don't like it, and they, and they want, you know, like an open one. Well, shit. They can go create it themselves, right? You know. Yeah. That's, that's it's it. a it's supposed to be a free market, right? So, like, Paz uh, Area A or whatever can can compete with Paz Area B and C and D and so forth, right? So, um, kind of like those examples we uh, gave last episode uh, from Wikipedia, let's say, hypothetically, like, whether it's Freetown Christiania or or uh, or even the Zapatistas to some degree, uh, the certain areas in Chiapas. Um, again, if you don't want to live in the, the freed areas of Chiapas, maybe you want to go to Denmark and, and, and certain areas of Copenhagen that have been freed or whatever. Um, again, it's supposed to be a free market in, in liberated areas, I guess. Almost almost kind of in some ways, kind of like how, as, as on a historical note, kind of like how the French Maquis during World War II would liberate certain areas of France and even Paris at times from the, national, from the German National Socialists who were socialists and liberated certain areas. And it's almost, it's almost like Pazes are almost kind of like a, a maquis liberated area of sorts, actually. I, I guess maybe that that's your pop culture reference or and historical reference for the day is maybe that's one analogous way of kind of looking at it is that permanent autonomous zones are like are somewhat akin to like maquis liberated areas from the Nazis. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, you're trying to avoid that uh, that really nasty coercion. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's you know kind of the, kind of that that. Uh, Nazi aspect of it that's a little a little more severe like that's you know your life isn't in danger right now it's not uh you know shit well I've got to pay taxes that sucks uh it's awful but you know you can survive uh right yeah, yeah you're relatively you know as long as as long as you pay off the the mob boss uh you can rest assured knowing that uh you know likely you know probably uh you know you'll be fine to you know uh you know exist here uh you know in the so-called geographical area known as the United States for a little longer so it's right, not that's it's not certain but well, and, and and that's the democratic form of slavery, right? Where we, have, like I said last episode, where we have the freedom, hypothetically, to choose our own occupations. But otherwise, uh, government slavery is still the norm. It's just not it, – that's just the democratic version of it as opposed to the ancient Egyptian model of slavery with whips and chains and yes massa, no massa, like how uh, certain people on this continent have had to deal with at one time or another. And so that's just kind of the reality of the situation. You know, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation basically transitioned some people on this continent from the ancient Egyptian model of slavery to the democratic model of slavery, uh, but the slavery is still the norm. It's just it's just taken on a different face with different features, and um, and and that's the other thing too. The uh, the massa, the state, only uh, encourages and sometimes even defends in a kind of twisted roundabout way some civil civil liberties of some of the tax cattle on this tax plantation not because they care about our freedoms in any sense but because it encourages us to be more productive and provide more milk and meat uh, for the king's table because bottom line that's what it is they, they, they basically want the hosts, that's us, to basically be more productive so they, the parasites, can can basically suff, suck the lifeblood out of us more, more efficiently, shall we say. That's why the democratic model of slavery is more efficacious for the, para, for the status parasites than the ancient Egyptian model of slavery. That's bottom line what it is. Right. All right. Let's get to uh, number three here. Quote, uh, let me just double check here. Okay, yep. Uh, number three, the emergence of a genuinely alternative economy. Once again, this is already happening, but it needs a huge amount of work before it comes into focus. The sub-economies of Leoro Nero, untaxed transactions, barter, etc., etc., et tend to be severely limited and localized. BBSs and other networking systems could be used to link up these regional marginal economies, uh, quote, household managements, into a viable alternative economy of some magnitude. PM has already outlined something like this in Bolo Bolo. In fact, a number of possible systems already exist in theory anyway. The problem is how to construct a true alternative economy, i.e. a complete economy, without attracting the IRS and other capitalist running dogs. 
How can I exchange my skills as, say, a plumber or a moonshiner for the food, books, shelter, and psychoactive plants I want without paying taxes or even without using any state-forged money? How can I live a comfortable, even luxurious life free of all interactions, free of all inter... What the fuck is he... I think he had some typos. Yeah, that was a typo. Okay. Uh, how can I live a comfortable, even luxurious life free of all interactions and transactions with the commodity world? If we took all the energy leftists put into demos and all of the energy libertarians put into fu playing uh, futile little third-party games, and if we redirected all that power into the construction of a real underground economy, we would already have accomplished the revolution long ago. End quote. Can we give a, you know, a round of applause here? That incredible incredible yes just you know bashing libertarian the anti-libertarian libertarian party yes why waste time in politics yes thank you thank you and uh you know if, if, if you know more libertarians and anarchists you know committed themselves to agorism yeah a real underground economy we would have definitely would have already accomplished you know the so-called revolution as he puts it so well, let me let me state this as plainly as I can. I think what Hakeem Bey is is more or less trying to get at is that if pe if uh, people who claim to value liberty freedom uh, in any sense truly did so in any sense, what they would have done is given up political crusading and reformism and all things more along those lines, and they would have done any form of direct action. Um, it, much less any specific version of it. Um, and of course, what he's promoting here are the notion of autonomous zones, whether permanent or temporary. And yeah, he's right, of course, that direct action is always much more efficacious than reformism. And had the emphasis been on that, instead of things like you just mentioned, the anti-libertarian libertarian party, which even David Nolan mentioned, it's now a, uh, a bureaucracy, uh, is now an organization complete with a class of many bureaucrats who are more concerned with fundraising than with any sort of genuine proselytizing in any good sense of what that term means. Right, right. Then, yeah, what, it would have worked. What it this worked. brings to mind to me is uh, the free digital economy from Paul Rosenberg's The Lodging of Wayfaring Men. And it is a, it's a fictional story, but it's very realistic in a lot of ways. Very realistic. And I think the, the, the proposal here for a free digital economy all online – uh, well, not necessarily. On, it's 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 all facilitated, uh, you know, on uh, you know the internet, uh, so to speak. But it's both physical, as in, uh, you know, peer to peer. You know, I'm shaking your hand, Kyle. I sell you this. You pay me money, and that's good, right? Um, yeah. And it's also digital too. And once you know, people have rational self interest, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, some people want to make a lot of money, and if there's an opportunity out there, uh, even if it's kind of a gray area, uh, you know, some people will jump on that opportunity. Uh, even if they aren't uh, libertarians or even anarchists. Uh, so with the, the the example of the free digital economy in this book, so many people are getting on board. So many people, it's open source, so they're starting their own free digital economies. Uh, so you have this very decentralized sort of thing. Um, and what you get is, uh, you know, a large portion of the citizens <clears throat> are doing their business there, and the state's not getting their tax money. So yeah. it's a it was a bad deal in the book for the state, and uh, basically a basically you know kind of the 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 the, the idea it's not really a spoiler it's kind of I've kind of already laid laid it out but um, but yeah you know the state the state definitely struggles and towards the end of the book I it, you don't know for sure but um, you know I I imagine you know the the free digital economy uh, you know reduced the demand for the state because uh, people were taking the initiative themselves and, and and their own financial freedom so. I guess that would be an example, a fictional example of uh, the so-called uh, revolution that uh, Akeem Bay references here. Yeah, but much like how Old Man Rayo put it, you know, people will uh, will will in some ways only change their minds about how they think the world works and even even things of a more philosophical nature once they shift their perception of what opportunities are are available to them because otherwise they'll start doing ex post facto rationalizations of why the state is a necessary evil and all this kind of stuff right um they'll basically think backwards is what i'm trying to say instead of rationalizing from uh, or or trying to rationally determine from first principles what their values are, and then making decisions about their actions that are consistent with that. Instead, they'll actually go backwards and say, well, because of current opportunities, therefore, here's my worldview. And unfortunately, there's so many people in the, actually, that's the norm in the servile society, in the first realm, that people will look hypothetical, let's just say, quote unquote, practically, actually, it's anti-practicality, but anyway, um, it almost almost kind of an Ayn Randian way, right? It's it's like, oh, yeah, we're so pragmatic. No, you're not. You're actually being 
anti-pragmatic, kind of like anti-mind, anti-life, or however she put it. It's 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 the contrarian kind of controlled schizophrenic doublespeak kind of thing, um, where 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 yeah, they claim to be pragmatic, and then oh, we'll discover our values and virtues based on whatever is practical. And it's like yeah, and you'll also bet. Well, that's just an excuse to bend with the winds of political expediency at any given moment. And then you wonder why, like the Ron Paul, many of the Ron Paul supporters ended up, you know, voting for Donald Trump. How did that happen? Well, it was because they were perceiving, you know, they were they were still hung up on political crusading and such. And again, it was the they had lied apparently to themselves and to each other about what their values were, because again, they were perceiving what opportunities were available to them, and because they had not given up political crusading by the time the Donald came around, therefore, you had that whole uh, emergence of the so-called alt-right and the 20,000 problems that has generated. Um, and even oh, the fissure... <laughs> and, and, and even the fissure within the alternative media, which you and I have mentioned in previous episodes. So that's that's kind of where we're at in some sense. I, I would like to say this, though. In that same portion uh, that Hakeem Bey mentioned where he said about, or even using any state-forged money, well, that's why cryptocurrencies as well as precious metal bullion both are very important as as forms of free market um, tradable uh, en entities, right? The cryptocurrency may not necessarily be uh, a tangible good, like how precious metal bullion is. It's just a however, way to exchange value and however, value is subjective, yeah. Right, right, and they both both function as money, and then and then after that, it's more of an economics discussion as which which type of thing functions better as a form of money, and then that's kind of a separate discussion by itself, which is more purely of an economics question. But both metal bullion and cryptocurrencies both work like money in much the same way that cigarettes during World War II functioned as a form of money. Much like how um, the um, much like how different uh, American Indians would use pelts uh, as a form of money as well, or even the, even the concept of jewelry came from like precious uh, what was considered valuable shells, actually, um, you know, different and different colors and all that. You know, the notion of jewelry is actually you could say, uh, at least according to the dictates of Western civilization, a hypothetically primitive, uh, as as they as the colonialists would say, primitive form of money. As, as well, uh, there's, you know, again, much like how Karl Menger mentioned in the 19th century, you know, the origin of money lies not in the enactment of some sort of uh, status legislative enactment, but it was actually, it, it, it came about organically through the free market, more or less. Um, it was basically based on subjective uh, value uh, evaluation of what people were willing to trade for and such, and then money just kind of originated from there. So it's funny right, that right. Hakeem, Bey, Hakeem Bey mentions about using state forge really fiat currencies and all that. It's like, well, the current options available are um, metal bullion to one extent. And then, yeah, e even barter bulls like sugar, salt. I mean, historically, that's what salt has always been. You know, like, for example, even the phrase about Roman soldiers being worth their salt was because they were paid in salt. Um, right, right. Be, and, and, and so, yes, there's – so money – is not limited to a paper receipt with dead statists on them. Money is whatever people are willing to accept as, as a form of exchanging value. That is what money actually is. Money is a technology. But people really don't conceive of it as that because they just think of Federal Reserve notes as money, whereas money is a much more broader concept and yeah, you, we can point to, to specific examples like silver or gold or even Bitcoin, uh, at least to some extent. But the fact of the matter is, it's it's a free market. There's a free, there is such a thing as a free market in money itself as a technology. But people don't right, really conceive right. of that because they're economically illiterate. Right, right. And I guess to go back to the free digital economy example, that's kind of what the the, the, the second realmers are, are trying to do, too. I mean, there's obviously the, 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 the important separation, the important, you know, clear delineation between the first realm and the second realm. But uh, there there are, uh, you know, articles on interplex.net, and I do recommend going there and reading everything that's on there if you're interested in these sorts of subjects. But you'll 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 see articles about, uh, or I guess one article uh, in particular. Uh, obviously, the idea is to attract people to the second realm. That's kind of the that's kind of the the goal, right? To get people to actually 
be able to exercise their autonomy, their freedom. Uh, so there was uh, one article, and towards the end of it, I'm going to badly paraphrase, but uh, you know, if all of the tools for opting out were available for $29.99, uh, and it was it was easy to do, uh, there'd be a lot more people participating in uh, you know the the underground economy, the second realm, whatever you want to call it. And <clears throat> if it's that easy to opt out, uh, a lot more people would. And then again, you know, we're right back to uh, you know we would have we would have already accomplished the revolution long ago, as Hakeem Bey said. So. Um, so yeah, that, that is kind of, a, I guess, a secondary task of the second realm. Plus, uh, attracting people in is uh, attracting new money into the economy. So it, it kind of serves as a, a dual uh, economic and also, I guess, maybe a philosophical uh, sort of purpose. Yeah, exactly. Agreed. All right, so let's go ahead and move forward here. Uh, and this is number five. Obviously, skipping around, we didn't start with number one. So this is uh, number five on his list, and it's called uh, Festivals. Uh, quote, the past serves as a uh, the past serves a vital function as a node in the TAS web, a meeting place for a wide circle of friends and allies who may not who may not actually live full time on the farm or in the village. Ancient villages ha uh, held affairs which brought wealth to the community, provided markets for travelers and created festal time space for all participants. Nowadays, the festival is emerging as one of the most important forms of the TAS itself, but can also provide renewal and fresh energy for the past. I remember reading some, uh, reading somewhere uh, that in the Middle Ages there were, goddamn iTunes, just popped up an update. Anyways, getting back to it, I remember reading somewhere that in the Middle Ages there were 111 holidays a year. We should take this as our utopian minimum and strive to do even better. Note the utopian minima proposed by C. Fourier uh, consisted of more food and sex than the average 18th century French uh, French aristocrat enjoyed. B. Fuller proposed the term bare minimum for a similar concept. End quote. So yeah, festivals, uh, festivals, holidays, celebrations of your autonomy, uh, things like the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest and Intercon and other freedom festivals. Uh, that's, <laughs> you know, that's that's why people are so attracted to them. It's that one time of the year where they get to exercise their freedom, right? <laughs> uh, for yeah. for most folks, at least. Uh, so those definitely serve as a, as a, a power of power, a powerful powerful um, reason that that why passes are important. Yeah, yes, it is. And much like kind of was mentioned in the previous episode, the notion of festivities, the notion of almost a carnival atmosphere, of parties, of even good old fashioned just having fun is actually a way of exercising one's liberty, believe it or not, because when was the last time you could put on a party when you're in prison? Anybody right. Anybody know? Right. And, and, and I wanted to mention this, too, that the idea of the second realm is to emerge, like to, to you know get your feet wet, uh, or I guess this is probably the standard I guess the standard way that people transition to it. But you know they they they're 100% in the first realm. They come across the second realm. They do some trading there, and then eventually they you know decide to move their entire life to the second realm if they can. Well, he kind of you know puts a time frame here too that uh, uh, you know the freedom festivals are once a year. Uh, there are 111 holiday or yeah, 111 holidays uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, you know, we want this sort of happiness, this sort of fun, this uh, sort of exercising of autonomy to happen a lot more than a third of the year. Uh, is kind of what he's getting at here. Uh, so that definitely overlaps with the uh, the second realmers too. Yeah, exactly. So all right, uh, number six, uh, the living Earth quote. I believe that there exists plenty of good selfish reasons for desiring the organic, it's sexier, the natural, it tastes better, the green, it's more beautiful, the wilderness, it's more exciting. Communitas, as P. Goodman called it, and conv uh, conviviality, as I. Illich called it, are more pleasurable than their opposites. The living earth need not exclude the organic city. The small but intense conglomeration of humanity devoted to the arts and slightly decadent joys of a civilization purged of all its gigantism and enforced loneliness. But even those of us who enjoy cities can see immediate and hedonic motives for fighting for the environment. We are militant biophiles. Deep ecology, social ecology, permaculture, appropriate tech, we're not too picky about ideologies. Let a thousand flowers bloom. End quote. And actually, by the way, just 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 as a just from more of a purely writing aesthetic perspective, I actually do think his article on permanent autonomous zones is much better written than the original uh, article on temporary autonomous zones. A lot zones. more con uh, concise, yeah. Yeah, and and keep in mind the article on permanent, uh, what he called permanent tazes, but really a permanent autonomous zone, just for simplicity's sake. He wrote this – it was published in 1994, three years after the Temporary Autonomous Zones article came out in 91. So I guess maybe he had three years to uh, uh, improve That's his writing yeah. style. 
that or yeah that or i guess maybe test out uh more permanent permanent autonomous zones like you know attention yeah. communities or or a Senegalist communes or whatever whatever may have appealed to him at some point right that, that so, very well might have who knows right so i don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good here just just saying that um just from a more purely aesthetic point of view it's it this is this is a lot easier to read and comprehend and stuff even despite his uh his flowery rhetoric at times and uh, poetic fancy as he himself put it uh this is this is a lot better read and at least i think so yeah, yeah, I do too. I do too. And he was talking about permaculture back in the early 1990s, early to mid 1990s. So yeah, that's pretty. Uh, so yeah, permaculture has been around for quite some time. Uh, it's it's now picking up, which I think is great. But uh, but yeah, you know, as far as kind of the uh, uh, the the environmentalists, uh, environmentalists, I guess anarchist leftists, leftists uh, have been uh, you know practicing these things for a long time. So even even though uh, you know we may disagree with their economics, got to give them some credit for developing uh, these really great, I guess. Uh, um, really great um, farming techniques, I guess, uh, at least uh, in, in one regard. And also, too, I guess just one other point here. Uh, we're not too picky about ideologies. Let a thousand flowers bloom. I said something about like something similar to this in the uh, Vani podcast uh, when Jason Booth and I were chatting uh, about van nomadism is I'd much rather hang out with uh, uh, a leftist uh, van nomad than I would, you know, a libertarian political crusader. Yeah, I would, much, I would I would much more prefer that because you know first off they're taking the issue of themselves they're mm -hmm. um you know the you know, they're 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 doing this they're pursuing the strategy for the purpose of freedom and they say that explicitly for you know a lot of great reasons that I wholly agree with they're Venuans essentially um I'd much rather hang out with them I'd have a lot of I'd have a lot of terrific conversations with them or as with a libertarian political crusader I'd be talking about van nomadism and I'd be talking about Gary fucking Johnson so um that's not <laughs> uh, that's not what I that's not what I want right. Uh, so yeah, as far as uh, picky about ideologies, I'm not that much anymore. I'm really not. Uh, as long as they, uh, you know, respect property, or even if they don't believe in property rights, if they, uh, you know, e even if they, you know, just say, well, they do, so uh, we're just going to, you know, live and let live. Great, great, that's fine. Whatever, whatever. Yeah, and and see, that's that's kind of the other thing is, you know, old man Rayo criticized both. The advocates of limited government, aka the constitutional patriots of one flavor or another, and even the uh, the so-called anarcho-capitalists of, of various uh, flavors and versions thereof, because it was it was an issue about lack of integrity, right? Like, so how many minarchists, the limited government folks, how many of them were uh, testing the constitutionality of laws or successfully winning elections to even local government positions and so forth, like city council or something to that effect, uh, or even a county board of supervisors or whatever? Um, and then, of course, how many of the ANCAPs uh, or even voluntarists to some degree, uh, how many of them were successfully setting up like uh, dispute resolution organizations or private defense agencies or something to that effect? I mean, like, like what are the results? Like, whether it's limit, whether whether the goal is limited government or the goal is no government, how? What are the actual actions taking taken strategically to actually make those things happen as parallel tracks? And uh, quite frankly, I mean, this is kind of something that's kind of come up before, you know, in, in, in previous months and even years now. And uh, obviously, I uh, got yeah, not, not a lot of movement on that. So when you and I have kind of explored Vanu and other forms of direct action, it's 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 much more focused on a genuine uh, focus on practicality. Uh, not legality and, and so forth. Uh, because frankly, you know, life is way too short and collective movementism is a bad deal of any kind. So, you know, if you're going to wait around for other people to get their act together, then I, I, I mean, I guess, I mean, it, I mean, that would be kind of almost like the equivalent of, can you imagine just as a historical reference, can you imagine if the Irish had, had made the decision to, a, as a people to, well, we're going to wait around for the British to like, you know, get their act together and not oppress us. How, how would how, how would that work? But then look at what actually happened. Right. There was the Irish War for Independence. There was I mean, there's even that old song about, um, you know, go on home, British soldiers. And part of the refrain in the chorus is, you know, we fought you for 800 years and we'll fight you for 800 more. Mm -hmm. Right. That's now. Yes, that is that is more of a acting more like revolutionaries and, and things more along those lines. However, th my point here is that the Irish in relation to the Brits and the Limeys uh, and all that, the, the Irish 
are not waiting around for anything. They're taking the initiative. Uh, granted, maybe their approach wasn't necessarily the best with um, the IRA and even even well-meaning people like Michael Collins and so forth. Uh, that's more of a debatable historical issue. Would be more appropriate for another episode if we're going to get into issues of history and and strategy too. Uh, but I but I do admire them as a people for actually taking the initiative and, and trying to get away from the British Empire, uh, even though it ultimately was not successful, or at the very least, it resulted in the ceasefire. Where now we have now they have this odd situation of uh, there's Ireland proper, and then there's Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, which is completely batshit weird. And then, of course, when you consider Brexit, then, then that kind of compl complicates things even further. So the point here is that it's better to take the initiative and not wait around for people to get their act together because you will wait entire lifetimes and generations and possibly even centuries or even millennia waiting for people to get their act around, uh, getting their act together. Um, it's not worth it. You know, you only have, as far as I'm aware of uh, in terms of metaphysics, we all, each one of us individuals only have one lifetime and you have to make the most of it. Indeed, indeed. And that's why uh, building the second realm is so important. That's why temporary and permanent autonomous zones are such a core aspect of it. Uh, Taz is more specifically, or I guess more appropriately. But uh, there can definitely be some some, uh, some second realm passes without a, without a doubt. So uh, the last excerpt here is number seven on his list, Paz Typology. Quote, a weird religion or rebel art movement can become a kind of non-local Paz, like a more intense and all-consuming hobby network. The secret society, like the Chinese Tong, also provides a model for a Paz without geographical limits. But the perfect case scenario involves a free space that extends into free time. The essence of the past must be the long drawn out intensification of the joys and risks of the past. And the intensification of the past will be utopia now, end quote. So I, I don't know. What, what do you think? I think he's kind of saying, um, I, I think he's acknowledging that there, there are risks to, um, you know, these, these passes, right? Uh, there are inherent risks from, you know, them being immobile. Uh, so the idea is kind of live in the moment right that's kind of what he's what he's getting to here you know enjoy your autonomy enjoy your freedom as much as you possibly can now is uh kind of what he's saying i think yeah i, I find it interesting that he mentioned the chinese tong as an example because remember in the second realm book on strategy there was a really heavy emphasis on learning from some of the techniques of organized crime but then basically kind of uh, reappropriate, to be perfectly frank, reappropriating that for the second realm in a non-coercive manner, basically. And it's kind of interesting that in some sense, Hakim Bey was almost trying to kind of grasp at that. Again, his exploratory beams, as it were, right, as he himself phrased it in the other yeah, article. So yeah, you, you, you'll know it when you see it, you'll know it when you hear it. Yeah, you know what he's talking about. Yeah. And, and so, you know, again, whether it's the, well, there's, well, I mean, if we're talking about organized crime, I mean, there's the, there's the Italian Komora, there's the uh, Japanese Yakuza, um, there's different versions of the Russian mafia, even the Irish mafia in some ways, which actually is actually has less power now than they used to before. Um, and that, that's a whole nother thing for another time. Actually, there's a potential episode idea is maybe looking at different forms of organized crime historically and see what, uh, see what their histories have been. And of course the interaction they've had with government and the creation of snitches and all that, that actually, sorry, I know that's kind of a a little bit of a different topic. I just thought of that right offhand potential episode idea, uh, kind of going into 20 million different details of that. But suffice it to say, Hakeem Bey's reference here about the se about a secret society like the Chinese Tonk can provide a model. And it's like, yeah, well, in the second round book on strategy, they were kind of doing something similar by noticing that uh, different forms of organized crime have their own uh, legal systems, their own customs, their own infrastructure, their own safe houses, their own stuff, basically, is kind of what they were kind of getting at. And so Hakeem Bey back in 94 was kind of saying something, something similar here, wasn't he? Yeah, I think the Second Realm authors definitely drew inspiration. They mentioned Hakeem Bey by name, so they obviously read these. I'm, I'm sure they drew some inspiration from uh, from him. So I guess as we begin to close out, I've got a question for you, Kyle, that I, I'd like you to field. Uh-oh. So um, why are we talking about Tazes and Passes on the Building the Second Realm series? Why does this matter? Why is this relevant? It's relevant because the Second Realm is autonomous by 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 def by definition and all that the you know liberty and autonomy kind of go hand in hand you can't really have one without the other and the notion of an autonomous zone whether permanent or temporary is a 
practical manifestation of one's individual autonomy, uh, as it were. So the – and again, in, in the second round book on strategy, they mention temporary autonomous zones and Hakeem Bay by name as well as Agorism and Sam Konkin by name and all that. And they were trying to kind of blend – these different perspectives and approaches to direct action in a co into a cohesive strategy that could actually that could actually be efficacious for for many people. Um, so the reason we're kind of covering this is really kind of going back to the original source material and and trying to kind of make sense of it, uh, despite uh, some of the aesthetics of it, which I don't particularly care for. Besides that. Um, I, I'm I'm kind of glad that Hakeem Bay was um, was was as uh, had 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 this kind of uh, foresight uh, to the degree that he did. However, there actually is uh, one thing I would like to read briefly here, since we're kind of closing out this two-parter. Okay, so. Uh, for those who may not know, uh, the infamous J. Neil Shulman actually is a reader of mine. And this is, like, provable because he's commented on, on a lot of my uh, articles tr and trigger such. Trigger warning for the Freedom Fiends that may be listening. That's a sore subject. But, yeah, go ahead. And, hey, to be perfectly fair, I do disagree with Shulman regarding uh, intellectual property issues. But then again, so do other agorists, okay? So it's kind of like, okay, let me put up. Footnote on that, kind of set that aside, because, of course, when when we're talking about issues of freedom, we don't have to agree on anything. Even Larkin Rose mentioned that uh, in some of his speeches and such. So anyway, uh, Daniel Shulman is a, is a reader of mine because he kind of understands that I'm not a complete idiot. <laughs> uh, and I guess he finds value in it, and I, and I very much appreciate it because I, I like his work, and, and especially alongside Knight and such. And it was interesting. When I, re when I reposted the Temporary Autonomous Zones article of Hakeem Bay in full because I figured it would be good to make sure that uh, there wasn't just like one or two copies on the net. So I, I, I kind of think that's important for other reasons. You know, decentralized uh, free media publishing, as it were. J. Neil Shulman saw that on his feed and then decided to comment on it. And so this is what J. Neil Shulman commented on the Temporary Autonomous Zones article, which wasn't necessarily really about Taz's or even Paz's specifically, but was more about Hakeem Bay. So I'll read word for word what he said, and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll read my response. Uh, to, to what he said. So this is J. Neil Shulman talking, quote, temporary autonomous zones, anarchists, clandestine marketplaces, and the only science fiction reference being to a Marxist. Yet no mention of agoras, agorists, agorism, Samuel Edward Conklin III, the New Libertarian Manifesto, or the first novel and movie portraying all this, my own alongside night. Ideas may... Uh, not be property, but this ripoff of an entire movement's philosophy, strategy, and tactics without a single acknowledgement of the actual source is just rude. And what I expect from a communist liar rewriting history to bury an enemy, end quote. The long and short of it is that genial Shulman does not like Hakeem Bey, period. And so that's that's kind of the, the takeaway from that. Now, we'll, let's get to what I said in response. So I said, Shulman, as I understand it, your alongside Night novel was first published in 1979. SCK3 published the New Libertarian Manifesto in 1980, and Rayo's Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, was published in 1983 as an anthology, uh, parentheses, even though the chapters were originally published as articles ranging from the 1960s until 1974 when he disappeared, end parenthesis. So considering that uh, Hakeem Bey's concept of Taz was birthed in 1991, the sequence of events certainly makes plagiarism a possibility. So if anything, it could be argued that Bay's Taz idea is closer to Vanu, parenthesis, and invulnerability to coercion, end parenthesis, than agorism, which might explain why there's no mention of SAK-3, yet there is one passing reference to Vanu by name, and even that was rather dismissive. I think Bay was attempting to chart a third way here, and considering that Taz's are a thematic element within the hashtag Agora novella, parenthesis, which did combine Taz's with agorism, uh, end parenthesis, I figured it would be good to go back to the source and mirror, meaning republish the Taz article, and mirror exactly what Bay himself said, warts and all. So I basically was was kind of trying to kind of let him know and everybody else know too that there could be merit to Shulman's accusation uh, that Hakeem Bey did plagiarize 
somebody or anybody, whether Konkin well, see, specifically I, or not. It's, no, like, it's, it's not plagiarism. It's not plagiarism. It's, it's using an idea or a concept and kind of, uh, you know, writing it. He's presenting it in his, in his, in his own way. Um, now yes, I, I understand. Yes I understand the accusation that hey, like hey, like what, what, when I write stuff, uh, you know, I mention you know Ray O'Connor and all that sort of stuff because I find that important. But we, we're know, right. He, we, he just, we cite our sources. And he such, just yeah. he just felt he didn't feel the need to do that. Maybe maybe because. Well, I don't know. Maybe Conkin, maybe maybe these folks were you know popular enough that he didn't feel the need to mention them. Uh, maybe he thought that uh, it wasn't important. I, I don't know. Whatever it is, I, I, it's not plagiarism. You know, Con Sam Conkin or uh, Rayo didn't write these words, right? He didn't just go to uh, he didn't go to Vaughn of the Search Personal Freedom and republish an article and say it's a, say it was his. He didn't do that. Um, he just applied his own style stylistic uh, way of presenting the information. So it's not plagiarism. That's 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 bullshit. Well, again, I didn't want to piss off Shulman. All I said was that based on the chronology of when certain things were published by certain people, Konkin, Shulman himself, and then, of course, Hakeem Bey, that I said because of the timeline, it's possible, but I didn't want to kind of come down on it because I honestly just don't know. Because you know what? It's also entirely possible that Hakeem Bey came up with all of this out of his own head, and he never read Konkin or Rayo or even Shulman. It is completely possible Hakeem Bey came out of this out of his own head. And Shulman's kind of making an assumption that Hakeem Bey was aware of all of this stuff and then just, as he said, uh, ripped off an entire movement's philosophy, strategy, and tactics. But but again, so that's, so that's kind of the central question here. Did Hakeem Bey know about Konkin, Shulman, Rayo, etc., or not? And I am not sure how to go about answering that question, uh, you know, unless we unless the guy's still around and we can, he's, like, call him up and ask. The Wikipedia page uh, is up, or it says that he's alive. Uh, he would be age 72 to 73 right now. It doesn't show a death, so... Yeah, and, and again, this is not to say that Shulman is necessarily wrong. However, you know, as a journalist, I would like to get some facts, and unfortunately, regarding that, the, the particular accusation Shulman levied at, at Hakeem Bey, I don't know if that's actually factually based. And just because something is a possibility based on a chronology does not therefore mean it's a fact. That would be like a false correlation, if you will. Um, you know, that's, you know, and, and again, you know, it's there is such a thing as innocent until proven guilty, Mr. Shulman, um, just because the timing d d is enables a possibility of plagiarism doesn't actually mean the guy actually did it. You don't know this, that. And, and neither and this do dude, I. As, 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 as per the Wikipedia page, this dude traveled the Middle East a lot. It is very possible. That he just never followed up with, you know, what was going on with American anarchism, right? Like, there's there's yeah, certainly a possibility yeah, um, yeah, that he never he came did. across Konkin. He might have, uh, you know, came back to the U.S. and found some some communes or something, but that doesn't therefore mean that he was familiar with these folks. Um, so maybe he thought he was presenting a, a brand new original idea. I will say, yeah. from from my own, if I had to guess, uh, I'd say it'd be impossible for him, to, for him to not know about those folks. But that's just me. Um, I guess uh, let's get to the, the I guess the, the closing notes. I, I'd just like to say that Tazes and passes are both uh, you know great ways to uh, actually be able to exercise your autonomy, your freedom. Uh, Tazes, uh, as I said earlier, I prefer those because uh, uh, mobility uh, makes you so much more invulnerable to coercion. Uh, it really, really does, and that's why Rayo favored it so much. Um, and that uh, even when he did have uh, you know Vanu's shelters, he had handfuls of them. And uh, he would move around a lot. He'd have different uh, different purposes for uh, for for each one. So Taz's are uh, both of these are important, but uh, for 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 the second realm, uh, it's man. I, I I there could be second realms that are passes, but uh, this you know security is a major aspect. If you look at second realm book on strategy, uh, they spend a lot of time talking about that subject. So uh, I I would I would I would say uh, I guess just as kind of a, a, a word of caution, so to speak. Both of these are terrific. If you want to start a permaculture farm and intentional community, go for it. Please, you know, I'm, I'm overjoyed that uh, your focus is not political crusading and that you're trying, you're taking initiative to create your own freedom. I love that. I really do. Just understand that with passes, they're permanently fixed, and the coercers know where you are, uh, and therefore they can coerce you. Just look at, uh, you know, there's a, the anniversaries coming up. Uh, Waco, right? That was a pass. That was a pass. If they were a mobile uh, kind of religious sect. Uh, it would have been a lot harder for, for the uh, FBI to, uh, you know, facilitate a raid, right? So, yeah. 
or I guess it was ATF, wasn't it? Oh, wh- whatever it was. It, it was actually it was actually multiple ones. It was also like the Texas Rangers. There were like uh, there was actually a reference about like the six different badges or uh, of the of the so called law enforcement agencies that were flashed at uh, David Koresh. So yes, it Fair was enough. the yeah, ATF yeah. and the FBI and the Texas Rangers and a couple other ones that I don't remember right offhand. I mean, it was just it was just so atrocious what happened to those people. And again, it's like okay, they made their own lifestyle choices in the way that they did how dare how dare the first realm basically try to impose their values on those people on those branch davidians how dare they does that mean i want to be a branch davidian hell no i don't agree with their with their social norms and but i also don't goes, want their free to be oppressed how dare they that that uh, goes right it's, along it's, with you were, you were saying that we have to be better than them and this is what I love about the second realm is the first realm. Yes, they will definitely, whether no matter what alternative life, lifestyle you're pursuing, no matter, uh, you know, you have second realm, whatever, whatever type of task it is, the first realm will send their bludgies after you. They will. They do not respect you. Um, they don't think that you should be free. And if they do, um, they can't be free. And therefore, you can't be free. Um, whereas in the second realm, uh, that's why in the second round book on strategy, and it, it's kind of an interesting suggestion, but uh, when you're in the first round, pay all the taxes, follow the laws, et cetera, et cetera, uh, because, you know, we're not trying to impose our values on, you know, that society. Uh, we aren't. Rather, we'll let them have their, their, we'll let them have their freedom to choose what they want, and if they want a, a massive state, uh, then, then that's fine, but we're going to go over here, uh, you know, please leave us alone is kind of, kind of, kind of how it goes, right? So it's definitely not reciprocal. There is the autonomy of the individuals in the first realm is respected by those in the second realm, but the autonomy of the folks in the second realm is certainly not respected uh, by those in the first realm. Uh, that's just a, a guaranteed fact with, uh, with most folks in the survival society. So... I guess and for some, guess and for some of the li- and for some and for some of the listeners who may uh, raise their eyebrows at that statement you just made, here's a really good way to try and actually test that. Not that I seriously suggest anybody test this because you will get in trouble if you are discovered. But let's just say hypothetically, if you disagree with what Shane just said, here's an interesting way to test it. Try smoking some psychoactive substances. Uh, and invite as many people as you can to smoke psychoactive substances and just fi- and just time it, time it, how quickly the bludgies will raid in and murder your dogs and throw handcuffs on everybody and all that kind of stuff. That's a really easy way to mm-hmm. test it. Toss you in a cage I'm, for 20 years oh, oh, or however long it was. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, I, the, already, the two I, realms I'm, must remain separate. There's a very yeah, fine, fine, fine line there. And with this hypothetical, I'm not even talking about something like cannabis, which even the first realm is starting to kind of slowly come around that, hey, maybe they should legalize it or something because even they enjoy something like that. I'm talking stuff like LSD. I'm talking like like DMT, like the really fun psychoactive stuff. You try using that, inviting people without taking certain uh, you know precautions and all that. And uh, hell, even put it on fascist book if you're being an idiot about it. And and just see and time it. Time how fast you get oppressed by the bludgies. It's not even funny. Yeah. Because exactly. because and here's why I say that. Because if your autonomy was respected, you could take hypothetically, you could take psychoactives uh, during some sort of uh, party that was advertised on fascist book, and you would not be oppressed by the government. But because of the Controlled Substances Act and a few other things that are related to that and, and whatever, the so-called drug war, it is illegal. It is illegal, considered by the state to be illegal to do something like that, where they will fall on you like a ton of bricks, and you will become a felon. And then all the 20 million different legal handicaps that come with being a fucking felon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and good luck getting a job after that. Good luck uh, getting a loan. Good luck even renting an apartment when you're a fucking felon. And so, and so, yeah, people are like, "Oh, uh, you're of course your autonomy is respected." No, it's not. Not even close. Not even close. And this isn't even getting to other examples like the raw milk people or different other things that the state doesn't like. I mean, come on, come on, grow up, people. This is this is. I mean, this is grown up, you know, adult time where there are serious consequences if you don't take certain things seriously. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. So I, I guess uh, any any other closing thoughts for the listeners, or, or, or can I close her out? I would just simply say this. Um, 
arguably in some ways the concept of a PAS, a permanent autonomous zone, is in many ways not entirely dissimilar to what I think you and I have mentioned um, during, I think it was season two of, of the Vanu podcast, regarding versions on a theme, whether it be private cities, whether it be sovereign free ports, um, or, or other versions and themes thereof, where the idea was pretty much to kind of segregate off a physical space of some kind and have it be um, an area that's been liberated by that to go with the you know the analogy or the metaphor or whatever that I was mentioning earlier an area that's essentially been liberated from the the Nazis essentially kind of like the French Maquis did during World War II where they would liberate areas of France uh, even of Paris in some circumstances and liberate that from Nazi control because of course the German National Socialists were socialists and people keep forgetting that so liberating those areas from Nazi control in some ways the permanent autonomous zones are kind of like a version on the theme of that where we're liberating these areas from uh, from the state. The question, though, is after you liberate the area, can you actually hold it and maintain it? I'm very skeptical about, at least in this time period, of actually doing that efficaciously, not so much because of technological barriers or so much of even uh, military capacity, to be perfectly frank. It's I think it's more of a lack of will than anything else, because there are so many people that are still invested in political crusading. Uh, there's way too many controlled schizophrenics. And even if you were to somehow get 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 uh, <laughs> deal with those two phenomenon, there's still the collective movementism of where we have to get together in order to and then and then the movement leaders betray their own people and all that. And so you have all these social dysfunctions in different ways. Where people being hypocrites or selling out their own people, or 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 or, or worse, promoting reformism, and and then it's kind of like, okay, so with all of this social dysfunction, how can people actually get together, segregate a, a certain area, even if it's like twenty acres, even segregate off a certain area, defend the borders, those private property borders, defend it, do it well, kind of like how the Rojavans did in some sense, defend those borders and maintain it. It's it's almost it's actually almost kind of like um, that one libertarian whose last name I don't remember, but he's known as Roman, uh, the guy who expatriated to the Ukraine, where he more or less said that grown-up libertarianism is using guns to defend property rights. So it's almost kind of like getting libertarianism back to its original roots, where my family defends this wall, your family defends that wall, that portion of the wall, and inside we have a market with property rights. If people, I'm paraphrasing what he said. If people want to uh, come in and assimilate, uh, at least with our uh, private property norms, they are welcome to. But if you have hostile, uh, evil status, criminal types who basically want to tear down our walls that protect our free market and all that, then we'll just straight up kill them out of self-defense. Um, again, that's more of a kind of somewhat more revolutionary way or some maybe even vigilante way of looking at it. I guess maybe the notion of a permanent autonomous zone is very similar to that. But maybe not not so heavy on the killing part. In fact, actually, what's interesting is that a temporary uh, actually, autonomous do, zone. Should I, I? I actually pulled up a quote because I was I was I'm gonna actually post that quote. You want me to read the full quote by Roman uh, Skesqua or however you pronounce his name? Yes, please do, please do. Okay, so this is uh, Kyle put this up as a, a quote of the week on his blog, thelastbastille.com. Definitely make sure to check that out. Uh, so Roman says, "Quote: So here's the question for libertarians." Is property the natural state of man which can be returned to once we can be returned to once we explain its obvious benefits to enough people, or is it something only desired by a minority of people and achievable only when people are willing to fight for it? I'm in the latter camp, and I want to see libertarianism return to its warrior ar aristocratic roots. Your family guards that wall. My family guards this wall. Inside, will we have a market? Inside, we'll have a market with property rights. If people attempt uh, attempt to breach our walls, we will kill them. If people are ready to help defend our norms, we will welcome them. End quote. And that was from uh, the Daily Anarchist. So, uh, yeah, I love that quote. Yeah, and so in some ways, the per the idea of a permanent autonomous zone with private property borders is really pretty is pretty close to what Roman, the Ukrainian anarchist, was was kind of getting there, getting at there. Um, I guess I guess maybe the one difference between that and a Taz is that instead of killing the hostile status from breaching the private property borders, um, the idea is just simply move away and or hide, right? And that's getting closer to more more like Vanu in that way. So maybe that's maybe part of my hesitation regarding the efficacy of permanent autonomous zones is that 
depending on if a particular situation deteriorates enough, you might have something kind of resembling um, a version on a theme of like a Bundy standoff type type thing. Or if not necessarily that, uh, some other – maybe there could be a better example of that. But basically something where you're you're looking at a situation of civil defiance. Even if there's no bloodshed, but basically where people are getting ready to kill each other, it's just the shots haven't been fired yet. Maybe, maybe analogously, this would be uh, actually historically, this would be kind of like Lexington and Concord before they started killing each other, uh, where basically everybody's kind of tense, everybody's got their guns out, they're ready to fight, but they haven't done it yet because they're still trying to go for a peaceful solution uh, at some point. And I guess maybe that's my hesitation with permanent autonomous zones was that even if it is successful, even if you do establish it, even if you do have something resembling uh, access control and or private property borders, even if, 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 um, depending on whether the status want to breach those walls or not, you're going to have to make a decision about whether you're willing to kill them or not. Um, when it comes to temporary autonomous zones, by contrast – you can pretty – for the most part, you can pretty much avoid even having to consider lethal force except maybe in some some minor circumstances if like you're getting rushed by like a mob or some sort of extreme zombie apocalypse situation or something. But generally speaking, in normal day-to-day -day life, with temporary autonomous zones, I think the one good selling point would be – even having to find yourself in a circumstance where you would have to use lethal force as a form of self-defense is really going to be more exceedingly rare than not. The, the, the likelihood or the risk of that is almost nil because you can just simply move away. Exactly. Hence the, te hence the temporariness of the autonomous zone versus if it's permanent – the issue, the issue of having to use lethal force of self-defense actually becomes a very real – because you have to hold the ground because it's a, supposed to be a permanent autonomous zone. So therefore you right, have to right. hold the ground. You right. have to hold the ground. And that's my, my, my one concern is you know, considering how the limited government constitutional patriot types are in certain things uh, in their history, which we will not go into here tonight for, for purposes of time, um, some of them, like the Oath Breakers, have a tendency to run away. Especially with that whole fake drone attack that took place during the Bundy standoff. So that's kind of an issue where when there was a time to actually maybe hold the ground when that actually was the right thing to do, they didn't do it. And so, you know, it's – it's but, but, but of course, you know, when – but of course with their hypocrisy when, uh, you know, the, the government military bases get attacked by like one or two uh, criminals or whatever, then uh, – oh, then the Oath Keepers are the first ones to go and defend the military bases and, and such. And that that's the controlled schizophrenia there that I'm kind of concerned about because now we're getting issues of how controlled schizophrenia – is now influencing decisions about whether to use lethal force or not. See, that's that's where the actual real world adult consequences come into play when it's when it's getting down to life and death issues. So with permanent autonomous zones, that's always going to be a risk, even if it's a low risk, even if you're in an area that's pretty far away and or the people of the first realm, the status, the authoritarians don't really want to breach your private property borders. It would still be a low risk, even the best of situations, but you would still have to have some way of defending physically uh, those borders, which is kind of the one problem, as opposed to a temporary autonomous zone where you can pretty much just move away and only have some really kind of like, okay, let me and put that, it this and that's, way. That, that's, that's what I was going to say was if uh, you're if you're at uh, you know some sort of a TAS like let's say RTR for example that big uh, that big Van Nomad meetup out in the west somewhere in the desert, if uh, you know things become uh, if, if you're if you're there and you're in your converted van and and you know things start to get weird and you don't really like it, uh, well what do you do? Well you just you know uh, you know put the pack up your van and leave. Uh, whereas if that's a PAS, uh, you're you're kind of invested in it. <laughs> you're kind of invested, and it's much harder to just pick up and it's, uh, you know to, to pick up and move. Uh, it really, really is. Unless, right. uh, unless, unless the unless it's a situation where it's uh, where one of these passes is an, is I guess a node, uh, network node for these various TAS communities, so to speak. Um, then the TAS people could just leave, but the people who are invested in it, the ones that have the money into it, the ones that are uh, gaining the, the uh, that are uh, you know gaining those profits, they have to stay and defend it. So. Um, but yeah. they kind of have to. So, so I definitely understand be, your concern there. Be, because of because of how because of how incentives work. Because I actually understand economics and so forth. And so, and, and so, yeah. The, I think the one good selling point about temporary autonomous zones is that the option of leaving is the peaceful solution if things kind of start going really bad. 
uh, real quick. And then, of course, another task can be reestablished just as quickly, right? Um, and really, the only real circumstances I can kind of foresee where lethal force would even be really a serious thing to consider would be some really exceedingly rare almost extreme, genuinely, I mean the term extreme, uh, circumstances like hypothetically if like a biker gang surrounded a van nomad and was basically trying to torch the guy or something, but that's almost like something you would read like in a crime fiction novel kind of thing where it's 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 so extreme that it's really more fit for fiction, like a fictional novel or something, not something that actually happens in real life because, well, again, why would a biker gang want to harass a guy living out of his van? See, that that the the the, the incentives there don't make any sense because there's nothing for them to loot, right? There's other there's other targets, there's other things where they, they are more efficacious at looting unless they're just psychos or something. Um Right, right, yeah. Yeah. So But 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 looting a permanent autonomous zone actually makes more sense because they're a fixed place and there's wealth production and there's so actually a bike not even necessarily the state, but even a biker gang type thing, assaulting a permanent autonomous zone and breaching down the borders, whether physical or otherwise, actually makes more sense to me. As 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 basically being yeah as basically being a more viable target for a lot of reasons, especially if you have a lot of machinery that can that can produce a lot of things, whether it's guns or or not even weapons, but even just forms of technology that or products that the biker that our hypothetical hypothetical biker gang can profit from. So that's another thing too, is that a permanent autonomous zone could be a target unless they're very good at defending or otherwise deterring threats. Uh, could be very much a, a, a almost a beacon for even organized criminal syndicates of one flavor or another to either uh, to, to basically steal from is essentially what I'm getting at. Uh, as opposed to the temporary as, as opposed to temporary autonomous zones where the where the criminal syndicates can't even find you. <laughs> yes, That's all I'm yes, saying. exactly. exactly. Yeah.